Chapter number thirteen, part two of the life of Captain James Cook, the circumnavigator, by Arthur Kitson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter number thirteen, seventeen seventy two to seventeen seventy four, the second voyage, part two. New Zealand once more. On the seventh of October, sailing for New Zealand they were delayed by contrary winds and did not sight the neighbourhood of table cape till the twenty first they stood in to tolago and poverty bays with the intention of presenting any chiefs who came off with pigs fowls and garden seeds in hopes of making a commencement in stocking the island but none were seen till cape kidnappers was reached when two made their appearance and were duly given two boars and two sows, and four hens and two cocks, first obtaining a promise that they should not be killed. To these were added a supply of seeds, such as peas, beans, cabbage, turnips, etc. Standing on through a series of heavy squalls, in one of which the resolution lost her fore top gallant mast, they ran into a violent gale, which lasted for a week, and after a slight moderation, came on with increased fury, and the two vessels parted company. On the 3rd of November, the Resolution reached her old anchorage in Ship Cove, Queen Charlotte's Sound, but the adventure was seen no more during the voyage. Forster was much upset by the stormy weather, the dreadful energy of the language of the sailors, the absence of their consort, which doubled every danger, the shortness of the table supplies, and his own dislike to a further trip to southern latitudes. Hoping the adventure might yet come in, Cook pushed on with his refit and thoroughly overhauled his stores. About four thousand pounds weight of ship's bread was found unfit for food, and another three thousand pounds nearly as bad. They were very fortunate, therefore, in getting a plentiful supply of scurvy grass and wild celery, and a small quantity of vegetables from the gardens they had previously laid out. Any doubts that may have been felt about the cannibalism of the New Zealanders was set at rest by some of the officers who surprised a party engaged in a feast. A human head was purchased from the feasters and taken on board, and a piece of the flesh being offered to a Maori was greedily devoured. A South Sea Islander, Oditi, was intensely horrified and refused to touch the knife with which it had been cut, nor would he be in any way friendly with the eater. Cook firmly believed that only enemies killed in battle were eaten, and did not think the custom arose from any shortness of food enclosing in a bottle which was buried under a marked tree in the garden a memorandum giving the dates of his arrival and departure the direction he intended to steer and other information he thought might be useful to furneaux cook sailed on the twenty fifth of november and as they passed through the straits guns were continually fired and a sharp lookout kept for signs of the adventure but nothing was seen, and as no other rendezvous had been appointed, Cook gave up all hope of her rejoining him. The resolution, when clear, bore up for the south-east, but had the course at the first been north of east, the two ships might possibly have met, for the adventure was then on her way from Talago Bay, and arrived in Ship Cove, four days after the departure of her consort. Cook says his crew were in good spirits, and in no way dejected, or thought the dangers we had yet to go through were in the least increased by being alone. They were quite ready to go, wherever I might think proper to lead them. Even Mr. Forster had to admit at a little later date that, notwithstanding the constant perils to which our course exposed us, in this unexplored ocean, our ship's company were far from being so uneasy 
as might have been expected. Armour of Ice On the 6th of December, at 8.30 a.m., they reckoned they were at the antipodes to our friends in London, consequently as far removed from them as possible. Here, a swell coming from the south-west showed there was no great body of land in that direction, except at a considerable distance. The first ice was seen on the 12th of December, in 62 degrees 10 minutes south, and on the 15th, in 66 degrees south, they were obliged to edge away north, as they were surrounded by large quantities of loose ice, and it was very foggy. Working up to between 64 and 65 degrees, they again headed east, still hampered by ice and fog, but in a few days the weather improved a little, and they recovered the Antarctic Circle, and reached 67 degrees, 31 minutes south, on the 23rd, the highest south latitude hitherto attained. The rigging was so coated with ice that it was difficult to work the ship, and Cook altered his course to the north-east. Mara says, under the 18th of December, icicles frequently hung to the noses of the men, more than an inch long. The men, cased in frozen snow, as if clad in armour, where the running rigging was being so enlarged by frozen sleet as hardly to be grasped by the largest hand. Yet under all these hardships, the men cheerful over their grog, and not a man sick, but of old scars. Cook says that some of the men suffered from fever brought on by the unavoidable exposure to cold and wet, but it was slight and happily yielded to the simplest remedies. The ship was so surrounded by masses of ice as to cause some apprehension but by taking advantage of every breath of air, the danger was adverted. Christmas Day was passed in constant watchfulness. We were fortunate in having continual daylight and clear weather, for had it been foggy as in some of the preceding days, nothing less than a miracle could have saved us from being dashed to pieces. On the 7th of January, 1774, Five very successful observations gave the mean longitude as 123 degrees 21 minutes west. The watch gave it 123 degrees 44 minutes and the dead reckoning as 123 degrees 39 minutes. Cook signifies his keen apprehension of the watch machine and says... I must here take notice that our longitude can never be erroneous while we have so good a guide as Mr. Kendall's watch. Obedient and alert. A further attempt to the south was made, and on the 30th of January the high latitude of 71 degrees, 10 minutes south was reached, in longitude 106 degrees, 54 minutes west further progress being stopped by a large and solid field of ice. This record was not beaten till 1823 by Weddell, and until recent years very few of the attempts on Antarctic discovery had proved as successful, satisfied that there was no continent existing within the Arctic Circle, except so far south as to be practically inaccessible on account of ice he acknowledged he did not regret he found it impossible to go further, and thinking that in the unexplored parts of the South Pacific there was room for many large islands, and also that discoveries already made had been imperfectly laid down on the charts, he decided that it was his duty, as he had a well-found ship and a healthy crew, to remain in these waters and add what he could to the knowledge of geography. He therefore planned to find the land discovered by Juan Fernandez in 38 degrees south, and if unsuccessful, to proceed to Easter Island and fix its position, as it was very uncertain, then to proceed to Otaheite 
where he had a faint hope he might hear from the adventure, and proceeded further west, settled the position of Tierra Astral de Espiritu Santo of de Queros, afterwards to turn south-east, and reaching Cape Horn in November, he would have the best part of the summer for exploration in the South Atlantic. He says, Great as this design appears to be, I, however, thought it possible to be executed, and when I came to communicate it to the officers, I had the satisfaction to find they all heartily concurred in it. I should not do these gentlemen justice if I did not take some opportunity to declare that they always showed the utmost readiness to carry into execution in the most effectual manner every measure I thought proper to take. Under such circumstances, it is hardly necessary to say that the seamen were always obedient and alert, and on this occasion they were so far from wishing the voyage at an end that they rejoiced at the prospect of its being prolonged another year and of soon enjoying the benefits of a milder climate. Mr. Forster does not agree with this account, for he says, The long continuance of these cold climates began now to hang heavily on our crew, especially as it banished all hope of returning home this year, which had hitherto supported their spirits. At first a painful despondence owing to the dreary prospect of another year's cruise to the south seemed painted on every countenance till by degrees they resigned themselves to their fate with a kind of sullen indifference it must be owned however that nothing could be more dejecting than the entire ignorance of our future destination which without any apparent reason was constantly kept a secret to every person in the ship it is evident that cook and his officers did not think it necessary to consult mr forster as to the movements of the ship or what is more probable he was in one of his irritable moods and must say something nasty about someone the decision to turn northwards was taken none too soon for on the sixth of february a furious storm came on playing havoc with the sails and running rigging and though it abated somewhat next morning, it blew very strong till the 12th, and would have been highly dangerous if it had caught them amongst the ice. On the 17th, Cook judged he had crossed his outward track of 1769, and on the 20th he notes the thermometer rising to 66 degrees, the only real summer day they had experienced since leaving New Zealand. Having arrived at the position laid down for the land supposed to have been seen by Juan Fernandez, he cruised about, but found no signs. So on the 25th stood away for Easter Island. Cook was now taken seriously ill, and was confined to his bed for several days by what he calls the bilious colic, during which time Mr. Patton, the surgeon, was to me not only a skilful physician, but an affectionate nurse. He recovered very slowly, and the want of fresh food told against him when it came to the question of gathering strength. The only fresh meat on board was a dog belonging to Mr. Forster, which was duly sacrificed and made into soup. Thus I received nourishment and strength from food, which would have made most people in Europe sick. Mara's journal says, under the 23rd of February, this day the captain was taken ill, to the grief of all the ship's company. 28th February, the captain this day much better, which each might read in the countenance of the other, from the highest officer to the meanest boy on board the ship. 4th March, the captain perfectly recovered from his illness, to the great joy of the ship's company. Easter Island At 8 a.m. on the 11th of March, Easter Island was sighted from the masthead, and shortly after noon, 
some of the gigantic statues mentioned in Roguin's voyages were clearly distinguished through the glasses. The position of the ship at noon had been fixed as 27 degrees 3 minutes south, 109 degrees 46 minutes west, standing on and off till next morning, fair anchorage was found in 36 fathoms, but it proved too near the edge of a bank, and they were driven off it in the night. One of two canoes came out to meet them as they were working back, from which plantains were purchased, and Cook proceeded ashore, where he was immediately surrounded by natives. Indeed, some even swam out to meet him. Many of them possessed European hats, jackets, handkerchiefs, etc., which they were said to have obtained from the Spaniards in 1770. Their language was very similar to that of Otaheite, and Oditi was able to understand them fairly well. There were no trees exceeding ten feet in height, and the land was described as extremely parched and dreary, though a few plantations were seen. Some remarkable pieces of stonework were noticed, enclosing small areas of ground, in some of which were the statues already mentioned. These were not looked upon by the natives as objects of worship, although they did not like the pavements by which they were surrounded being walked over, or the statues being closely examined. Mr. Forster regarded the enclosures as burial grounds, and the statues, portions of some of them are at the British Museum, as monuments to chiefs. The water supply being found very bad, though Gonzales is said to have found good springs, and the fresh food for sale but scanty, the stay was cut short, and on the 16th of March, sale was made for the Marquises, discovered by Mendana in 1595. The next day, according to Mara, the fresh provisions obtained were served out to the crew at the captain's expense, namely two pounds of potatoes a man and a bunch of bananas to each mess, and this without reducing their ordinary allowance, an act of generosity which produced its effect. It preserved the crew in health and encouraged them to undergo cheerfully the hardships that must unavoidably happen in the course of so long a voyage. Market spoilt. The Marquises were reached on the 7th of April, and after a narrow escape from running on the rocks, satisfactory anchorage was obtained, and they were visited by some of the natives, from whom breadfruit and fish were purchased. The next day further trading was done, nails being the chief medium of exchange, but the natives were inclined to be smart in their dealings, and on several occasions obtained payment without delivery. Cook here suffered from a relapse, but was able to get about, and after warning the officer on watch to keep a smart lookout, or something of importance would be stolen, he took his seat in a boat to go in search of a better anchorage. He was then informed that a stanchion had been stolen from the gangway, and the thief had got away to his canoe on the other side of the ship. He ordered a shot to be fired over the canoes, but no one was to be hurt, and he would pull around and secure the thief. The order was apparently misunderstood, for the thief was killed, and the rest of the natives hurried ashore. Soon after, trading recommenced, and the lesson appeared forgotten, for an attempt was made to steal the kedge anchor, by which the ship was being warped nearer the shore. Cook landed, and the trading went on as if nothing out of the common had occurred, and some pigs, so small that it required forty or fifty to provide one meal for the crew, and fruit were purchased. But in the afternoon, when the boats went in for water, all the natives had disappeared. This Cook attributed to not being with them, for the next morning when he landed, trading was resumed. A short trip was made in the boats along the coast, and when they returned it was found the market was closed. 
it seemed one of the young gentlemen had given a small handful of red feathers he had obtained at Tonga for a small pig, and now nothing else would be accepted, so they sailed for Otaiti on the 11th. Cook was very much annoyed at the ill success in obtaining fresh provisions, for though none of the crew were ill, he thought they stood in need of a change of food. He describes the inhabitants as the finest race he had seen in the South Seas, almost as fair as Europeans, and their language very similar to that of Otaheite. Their arms consisted of clubs, spears and slings, the two former very neatly made. With the latter they threw stones a considerable distance, but without accuracy. Mr. Forster managed to secure a quantity of small birds with very beautiful plumage. On the 17th of April, they sighted the George Islands, discovered by Byron, native name Tiukia, but after sending the master to report on the lagoon, Cook decided it was too dangerous to enter, and Mr. Cooper went off with two boats to see if it were possible to trade. He obtained a few dogs and coconuts, but the attitude of the natives was so uncertain he would not land, and returned to the ship. One of the sailors exchanged a platane for a dog, so it was concluded the fruit was unknown. On the 19th, four more islands were discovered, and named Palisar Islands, and on rounding one, a strong swell rolling in from the south was encountered a sure sign that we were clear of these low islands. On the 21st, land a little to the east of Point Venus was sighted, and next morning they anchored at Matave Bay, being immediately visited by the natives, who seemed greatly pleased to see them again. The old camp was reoccupied, the observatory set up for Mr. Wales, and Cook had again the pleasure to record he had no one on the sick list. The king, Otu, came to visit the camp, bringing as his present a dozen pigs and some fruit, and then with some of his friends went on board ship to dinner and to receive the return present. It was then found that the red feathers were greatly valued, a very fortunate thing as articles of trade were running short. Cook, after the disappointment in securing supplies at the last visit, intended to make a very short stay, but the place now appeared to be very thriving. Houses and canoes were being built in all directions, and there was every sign of prosperity, so he decided to remain and refit. On the 25th of April, they had a thunderstorm lasting three hours, such as no one on board had experienced before. The Otahitian Fleet Going to visit Otu on the next day, Cook was surprised to see a large number of fully manned canoes ranged along the coast, and a large body of armed men on the land near them. On landing, he was surrounded by people, and seized by two chiefs, one of whom wanted to carry him off to see the king, and the other to see the fleet, and between the two, I was like to be pulled to pieces, the crowd making way with cries of Tia non tutti. He was gradually drawn towards the fleet, but refused to go on board, and after a time was allowed to return to his own boats when he found his companions had been subject to similar treatment. They put out from shore in order to have a good look at the fleet, and counted 160 large double canoes, all well equipped and fully manned. The chiefs were swathed in vast quantities of cloth, so that to the Englishmen it seemed almost a miracle they were able to move. The vessels were decorated with flags and streamers, and made a very fine appearance. These were the first line, and in addition, there were 170 smaller double canoes, each having a small house or castle on it, which were thought to be transports and storeships 
as the larger ones, as far as could be seen, carried no supplies on board. The number of men on board was estimated to be no less than 7,500, and it was ascertained this armada was intended for the subjugation of Imeo, which had lately rebelled against Otaheite. Cook was informed Otu was waiting at the camp for him, but on going there he found he had not been there, and on looking for him again in the afternoon he was still invisible. The fleet had also gone away, and then it was discovered that some of Cook's clothes had been stolen from the wash, and the king and admiral were both in dread of his anger. However, Cook sent word he should not take any steps to recover the stolen articles, and things resumed a friendly aspect. The admiral, Tofa, sending Cook a present of two large pigs and some fruit, giving orders to the bearers that they were to receive nothing in exchange. He soon after paid a visit to the ship, and as it was his first, he examined everything with great curiosity, and appeared greatly impressed with what he saw. One of the natives, having been caught making off with a small water cask, Cook determined he should be punished, and made a ceremonial affair of it. The culprit was first sent on board and put in irons. The natives and the crew mustered, and then the thief was taken on shore and triced up. Cook then made a short speech, in which he pointed out that when his men were caught stealing from the natives, they were always punished, but the natives were always stealing from the ship and crew and getting away unpunished. He therefore ordered the man to be given two dozen lashes. These were duly administered, and Tofar made a speech in which he was understood to admit the justice of Cook's action. The marines were then put through their drill and fired a few volleys with ball, and the proceedings terminated. But Cook declares he did not know whether the natives were pleased or frightened by the ceremony. The king's brother then took some of the officers out to see part of their fleet at exercise, and they were just in time to see the conclusion and the landing of the men. Cook says the canoes were handled very smartly, and five minutes after putting ashore you could not tell anything of the kind had been going forward. The sea stores were again overhauled, and although the greatest care had been taken with the packing, large quantities of bread were found to be unedible, rendering the purchase of fresh food at every opportunity of the greatest importance. A state visit was paid on board by Otu's father and some other members of the royal family, who presented Cook with a complete morning dress, a curiosity we most valued. In return, I gave him whatever he desired, which was not a little and having distributed red feathers to all the others, conducted them ashore in my boat. Musket Stolen On the 7th of May, the king expressed a wish to see Cook, so the latter went ashore, but found his majesty and many of his leading men had disappeared, and the sergeant of marines reported that one of his men had had his musket stolen whilst on duty. Cook gave orders that if the musket was returned, nothing further was to be said, and returned to his ship. Suspicion was attracted to six canoes laden with fruit and baggage, so Cook gave chase in his own boat. One of the canoes then made for the ship, and the occupants, women whom he recognised, informed him they were taking some things to the resolution, and that the king was at Point Venus. Cook went to the camp to find this was only a story to put him off, and he once again gave chase, ordering another boat to follow. A few shots were fired over the canoes, and five out of the six surrendered, the one he had spoken with getting away. He was now told that the gun had been stolen by a native of Tiarabu, and therefore Otu was unable to get it back. So after a little discussion, 
he decided to put up with the loss, and sent word to the king that he would say no more about it. In the evening, however, the musket and some articles that had not been missed were returned, and the men who brought them were duly rewarded. Cook says it was remarkable how many had been actively engaged in their recovery. One man in particular described most vividly how he had followed up, attacked and killed the thief of the musket, but at the same time everyone was well aware that this hero had never been away from his own house throughout the day. A state call was made to Otu, and with the usual exchange of presents, the old footing was re-established. On the return from this visit, a stop was made at the dockyards, for such they deserved to be called, and the canoes in construction were inspected, two of them being the largest the Englishmen had yet seen. The king soon after returned the visit, and requested that the big gun should be fired, but Cook thinks it was very doubtful if the experience was enjoyed. A display of fireworks in the evening was much more to the native taste. Referring to the numerous robberies that had been committed, Cook says he found it far the best to deal mildly with the delinquents, and the regulations he made were, as a rule, well kept by the natives. He was now better pleased with his reception, and concluded that the island was in a more prosperous condition than at his last visit. When the ship was ready to resume her voyage, several young natives volunteered to accompany her, and Mr. Forster was most anxious to take one as a servant, but as Cook could see no prospect of returning them to their homes, he would not permit one to go. Mara Deserts When the anchor was weighed on the 14th of May, Mara, the gunner's mate, whose journal has been quoted, quietly slipped into the water and endeavoured to reach a canoe which was hanging about to pick him up, but he was seen and taken on board again. In his notes, he expresses his regret that the scientific world thus lost the chance of having the experiences of a prolonged residence amongst these people placed before it. At the time of leaving, there was great talk of the expedition against Emio, and Cook would have liked to have watched the proceedings, but he soon saw that nothing would be done whilst he remained in the vicinity. On their arrival at Huihine on the 15th, the ship was immediately boarded by Cook's old friend, Ori, with the usual present, and he and his friends were invited to dine on board. He was asked what he would like for the return present, and named axes and nails, which were given him with the request that he should distribute them amongst his people. This he did at once, to the apparent satisfaction of all. The thieving propensities of the natives were still as bad as ever. A shooting party was robbed of its stock of trade goods, and the day after three officers were seized and stripped, so Cook took an armed party ashore, captured two of the leading chiefs and a large house, and said he should keep them till the things stolen were returned. This had the desired effect, and everything was soon brought back. On the 23rd of May they sailed for Ulitia, and on their arrival the next day were well received, though it was evident provisions were rather scarce. They were informed here that two ships had arrived at Huihine, one commanded by Banks and the other by Ferno, and their informant describes both captains so well that it was some time before Cook ventured to reject the tale as too improbable. It is possible that there was some foundation for the story that ships had been seen, for it afterwards became known that Monsieur St. Denis had been in the South Pacific about this time with two vessels. Notwithstanding pressing invitations from the natives to stay, Cook sailed for Lord Howe's island, discovered by Wallace, reaching it on the 6th of June. 
but as it seemed uninhabited it offered no inducement for any stay on the sixteenth a chain of sandbanks and islets surrounding a lagoon into which no practicable entrance could be seen was named palmerston's islands and on the twentieth a landing was effected on savage island but as the natives were very threatening and the country enabled them to approach closely without exposing themselves the party retired to the boats a few spares were thrown and mara says that one would have struck cook had he not seen it coming and stooped in time to avoid it and then aimed with his gun loaded with small shot at the thrower but it missed fire a short time afterwards he again tried it aiming in the air and it was discharged forster attributes the constant misfires to the bad quality of the flints supplied by the government and says that english flints had a very unsatisfactory reputation on the continent more thieving the course was now set for rotterdam where they arrived on the twenty sixth of june and were fairly well received by the natives who brought supplies of fruit before the anchorage had been reached but they soon began to play the old game of trying to annex anything that took their fancy one seized the lead which was in use whilst a second tried to cut the line with a stone and was only persuaded to desist by a charge of small shot fired at his legs a small party of sailors went ashore for water and a quantity was obtained but again the natives became too pressing in their attentions the doctor's musket was stolen then mr clerk's then some other things and a cooper's adds and cook though at first inclined to take no notice felt compelled to seize two canoes and himself wounded a man who had rendered himself conspicuous by his disorderly conduct with a charge of small shot and it was at first rumoured he was killed this cook would not believe as he had been very careful not to fire at a vital spot after a time the muskets and some of the other things were given up so the canoes were returned to their owners and the ads was demanded instead of the ads however the reported corpse was brought on board and proved on examination by the doctor to be very little the worse for his experience having a slight wound on the thigh and a second one on the wrist he was soon on his feet and the ads was then produced the next day the people were very civil and the crew were able to water without interruption on the sixteenth of july they sighted aurora island discovered by bougainville but it came on to blow hard so they did not attempt to anchor the natives came down fully armed as if to oppose a landing and the ship passed on to whitsunday island off malakolo good anchorage was found and the natives came on board and were so pleased with their reception they returned the next day in greater numbers and whilst cook was in his cabin with some who appeared to be chiefs a great noise arose on deck a boatkeeper had declined to allow a native to get into his boat and the islander was fitting an arrow to his bow as cook came on deck with the intention of shooting the sailor cook shouted at him and he at once diverted his aim to the captain but the latter was too quick and peppered him with small shot spoiling his aim he was not much hurt and proceeded to fit another arrow to his bow when cook gave him the second barrel and induced him to retire some of the others also discharged a few arrows so a musket was fired over them without any effect a four-pound gun was tried and the effect was truly marvellous the natives in the rigging and on deck threw themselves into the water whilst those in the cabin jumped from the ports and the ship was left in peace cook was not favourably impressed by these islanders 
and describes them as, in general, the most ugly, ill-proportioned people I ever saw. Forster, however, thought they were very intelligent. They were judged to be a different race from the society or friendly islanders, and spoke a different language. Poisonous Fish after leaving, many of those on board were very ill for a week or ten days from having eaten of a fish which Forster calls a Red Sea Bream, and Cook believed to be the same as those which poisoned De Quiros's people, and in his account says, The fish had eaten of poisonous plants, all parts of the flesh became empoisoned, the ship appeared like the hospital of a city which had the plague. There was none who could stand on their feet. Owing to the care of the surgeons, however, all were recovered. The next land seen was a small group of islands named Shepherd's Islands, in honour of my worthy friend, the Plumian Professor of Astronomy at Cambridge and Mr. Forster complains that Cook's rashness and reliance on good fortune became the principal roads to fame by being crowned with great and undeserved success. This was very out of place at the time, for Cook was exercising the very greatest precautions as he fully recognised the dangers by which they were surrounded. He always stood off and on during the night, and only proceeded through unknown waters by day. Several of these islets were of a peculiar formation, and one high columnar rock was named the Monument. Forster gives its height at 140 yards, and other accounts are satisfied with feet. Many of the group were inhabited, but no favourable opportunity for landing occurred. On the 1st of August, a fire broke out on board, and Forster writes, Confusion and horror appeared in all our faces at the bare mention of it, and it was some time before proper measures were taken to stop its progress, for in these moments of danger few are able to collect their faculties and act with cool deliberation. After about half a page of this, on fires in general, he observes, Providentially, the fire of this day was very trifling and extinguished in a few moments. Then a few days after, a marine, who had fallen overboard, was smartly picked up, and being well looked after by his comrades, was soon showing no ill effects of his accident, thus giving Mr. Forster an opportunity to write of it as an example of the result of an esprit du corps to which sailors at present are utter strangers, an utterly unwarranted sneer. At Uramango on the 4th of August, Cook went in with the boats, and the natives tried to induce him to come on shore, but something roused suspicion after he and one man got into the water, so making signs that he would come back later, he stepped back. The natives then rushed the boats, trying to drag them onto the beach, and succeeded in stealing two oars, at the same time wounding several of the boat's crews. Amongst them, Mr. Gilbert, the master, with a shower of stones, spears and arrows. Cook attempted to give one of the chiefs a charge of small shot, but his gun missed fire, and he was obliged very reluctantly to order the marines to fire with the result that several of the natives were wounded. Under the circumstances, it was not considered worth while remaining, so the ship left for Tanna, some twelve leagues to the south. A bright light had been noticed in that direction the night before, which proved to have been caused by a volcanic eruption. A good anchorage was found at Tanna, and the ship warped close in. Several natives coming on board to trade soon developed the usual propensity to carry off anything that took their fancy. On this occasion the anchor boys were the special attraction. Muskets were fired over their head to no purpose, so a four-pounder was discharged, which for a time had a good result, 
but soon they were as bad as ever, so two or three musketoons were fired close to them, and though none were hurt, the crew were able to get their dinner in peace. Hot Springs An old man, called by Cook Paowang, appeared to be inclined to be friendly, so Cook landed with a strong party to look for water under his guidance, and met with some of the elders, exchanging presents with them. The next day the ship was warped in, and three boats went ashore, but the natives were very threatening, and after some futile attempts to put things on a peaceable footing, a signal was given to the ship and several guns were fired, when all the natives ran away except for Paowang, who was suitably rewarded for his confidence. After a time, permission was obtained to get wood, water and ballast, and whilst trying to lift a stone out of a pool below high water mark, one of the crew scolded his hand badly. The pool proved to be one of a series of springs running down a spur of the volcano into the sea. Several were tested with the thermometer, and as much as 202 degrees Fahrenheit was attained. Forster found a number of cracks on the ridge from which sulphurous vapour and smoke issued, and one of the crew who had been suffering severely from rheumatism received great temporary benefit from bathing in one of the springs. Many good plantations of yams, sugarcane and plantains were seen, but they could purchase very little as their articles of trade were not appreciated. The natives did not understand the use of iron, and did not require cloth, as they went almost entirely naked. Though no direct signs of cannibalism had been found, Cook was convinced that the practice was not unknown. After leaving Tanna, the western coast of the different islands were followed up till de Bougainville's passage was reached, when the course was set for Espiritu Santo. In passing Malacolo, canoes put off for the ship, but the wind being favourable, Cook would not delay and gave Forster the opportunity to remark that the main object of the voyage, that is, the obtaining of knowledge of the natural history of the islands, was made subservient to the production of a new track on the chart of the southern hemisphere. Cardinal Moran's Geography on the 25th of August, they entered the bay which Cook believed to be that discovered by de Quiros, and named by him the Bay of St. Philip and St. Diago, in the Tierra Austral del Espiritu Santo, now known as the New Hebrides. In this conclusion, Cook has the support of Del Rimple and modern geographers, but Forster, for some reason which is not quite clear, felt compelled to differ. Cardinal Moran, the Catholic Archbishop of Sydney, also believes Cook to have been mistaken, for in his history of the Catholic Church in Australia, he places de Quiros's discovery in Port Curtis, Queensland, where he claims that the first Catholic service ever celebrated in Australia was held. He puts aside the fact that the latitude of Port Curtis 24 degrees south, does not agree with that given by de Quiros, 15 degrees 20 minutes south, by saying that the positions of newly discovered places were in those days often purposely concealed, lest other navigators might appropriate to themselves and their respective countries the results of the discovery. He quotes details given in de Quiros's petitions to the King of Spain, and says, All these details fit in admirably with Port Curtis on the Queensland coast. Now de Quiros says the country he discovered was thickly inhabited by a people who were armed with bows and arrows, possessed vessels of earthenware, lived in houses of wood, roofed with palm leaves, were amply supplied with oranges, limes, pears, almonds larger than those of Spain, hogs, fowls, goats, capons, etc., that in the bay where he anchored 
there was no sandy barren ground, no mangroves, no ants, no mosquitoes, and that his anchorage lay between two considerable rivers. How these details fit in with Port Curtis may be evident to his eminence, but is not apparent to less distinguished mortals. The district of Port Curtis, when discovered, was thinly populated and shows no signs of ever having been otherwise. Bows and arrows and earthenware vessels were absolutely unknown throughout Australia. Houses did not exist, except in the form of temporary shelters of branches, leaves and bark. The fruits and animals mentioned were unknown, and sandy barren country with mangroves, ants and mosquitoes does exist in considerable quantity. The anchorage, had De Quiros ever been there, might have been between two rivers, the Boyne and Calliope, both of small size, but Cardinal Moran, to make this detail fit in admirably, has recourse to the bold measure of moving the mouth of the Burnet River from Wide Bay to Port Curtis, some two and a half degrees to the north of its real position. On the other hand, Cook's description of the New Hebrides fits in with much greater accuracy. The latitude was found to be 15 degrees 5 minutes south, and Mr. Cooper, who went ashore with the boats, reported that he landed near a fine stream of fresh water, probably one of those mentioned by de Quiros, and if we were not deceived, we saw the other. The country was described by Cook thus. An uncommonly luxuriant vegetation was everywhere to be seen. The sides of the hills were chequered with plantations, and every valley watered by a stream. Of all the productions of nature this country was adorned with, the coconut trees were the most conspicuous. A few canoes ventured near enough to have some presents thrown to them, but here the intercourse ended. For Cook felt that, notwithstanding the inviting appearance of the place, he had no time to spare from the great object of the expedition, namely the exploration of the Southern Ocean, and as the wind was favourable, sailed for New Zealand for a refit. End of chapter 13, part 2「Chapter number fourteen of the Life of Captain James Cook, the Circumnavigator by Arthur Kitson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter fourteen seventeen seventy four to seventeen seventy five Second Voyage Concluded On the fourth of September, Midshipman Colnett sighted a large island which was named New Caledonia, the point first seen being called Cape Colnett. An opening in the surrounding reef having been found by the boats, the resolution worked up to an anchorage and was quickly surrounded by canoes, whose first occupants were totally unarmed. At first they were shy of coming near, but at length one canoe was persuaded to receive some small presents and in return gave some fish, which stunk intolerably. But for all that, it was received in hopes more satisfactory trading might result. To some who came on board, dinner was offered, but they would touch nothing but yams. They appeared to know nothing of dogs, goats or hogs, but greatly appreciated both red cloth and nails. Cook landed and was well received, and water was pointed out, but it was too inconvenient of access. The land near a village was well cultivated and irrigated, the products being chiefly yams, plantains and coconuts. The latter were not bearing much fruit. On the 6th of September, Mr. Wales secured a moderately satisfactory observation of an eclipse of the sun, and was able to fix their position as 20 degrees 17 minutes 39 seconds south, 
164 degrees, 41 minutes, 21 seconds east. On the same day, the ship's butcher, Monk, a man much esteemed in the ship, fell down the fore hatch and died the following day from the injury received. Whilst some of the crew were engaged in watering, a small party went up the hills to view the surrounding country, but as the natives they met turned back to follow them, Cook remarks, At last our train was numerous. They were able to see right across the island, and estimated the width to be not more than ten leagues. On returning it was found the clerk had purchased a fish, something like a sunfish, and as the artist was engaged in drawing and describing it, the cook took the liver and roe for supper in the cabin, with the result that Cook and the Forsters were nearly poisoned, and were only cured by the most careful attention of the surgeon. When the natives saw the fish the next morning, they immediately signified it was unfit to eat, but Cook says nothing of the kind had been intimated when it was purchased. Norfolk Island The natives were described as robust and well-made, and not in the least addicted to pilfering, which is more than can be said of many other nations in this sea. The only tame animals they had were large fowls with very bright plumage. The country was said to consist of rocky hills, and the trees identical with those seen in New South Wales. Leaving a sow and boar behind, in hopes of their being allowed to breed, and marking a tree with the name of the ship and the date, they left for the Isle of Pines, where they arrived on the 19th. Here they were in very dangerous waters, and Cook says the safety of the ship was owing to the splendid way in which the watch was kept, and the brisk manner in which she was handled by the crew. Forster noted innumerable columnar forms of a considerable height, which we distinguished by the help of our glasses. He put them very proudly down as a basaltic formation, and afforded considerable amusement to Cook when he was able to prove they were only trees of the pine family. In fact, some were afterwards cut down on Botany Island and used for spars. They were unable to effect a landing on the Isle of Pines, owing to the rocky nature of the shore, but by some unknown means, Mr. Hodges painted a view of the interior of the island, published under that title in Cook's Voyages. Norfolk Island was discovered on the 10th of October, and landing was effected, but no signs of inhabitants were seen, though a welcome supply of fish, birds and cabbage palm was obtained. The vegetation bore a resemblance to that of New Zealand. On the 17th of October, Mount Egmont was sighted, and anchoring in Queen Charlotte Sound, an immediate search was made for a bottle containing letters which had been left for the adventure. It was not found, nor was there anything to show by whom it had been taken, but the next day they saw where the observatory had been set up, and trees cut down with axes, and so came to the conclusion their consort had been there. The natives, who were at first very shy, but when they recognised Cook, went jumping and skipping about like madmen, informed them that the adventure came in soon after they had left, and remained two or three weeks. A story also was told that a ship had been lost on the north side of the Straits, shortly before Cook arrived, and some of the people, having had their clothes stolen by the natives, fired on them but when their ammunition was exhausted, were all killed. This story evidently, a distorted account of what happened to some of the adventures crew, was disbelieved by Cook, who thought there had been some misunderstanding. Cook, from fresh observations, found that he had placed the South Island on his chart, some forty minutes too far to the east, and had made the distance between Queen Charlotte's Sound and Cape Palliser ten minutes nearer to each other than they should have been. In this connection, 
he speaks in the highest terms of the desire of Mr. Wales to have everything as accurate as possible. On the 11th of November, the Resolution left the Sound at daybreak to cross the South Pacific between latitudes 54 and 55 degrees, and the course convinced Cook there was no possibility of there being any large piece of land in that portion of the ocean. He therefore stood for the western entrance of Magallan Straits, sighting Cape Descada on the 17th of December, following the coast round to Christmas Sound, which they reached on the 20th. The country passed being described as the most desolate and barren I ever saw. At Christmas Sound they were more fortunate, for wood, water, wild celery, and a large number of geese provided them with a welcome banquet for Christmas Day. They were visited by some of the natives, described as a little, ugly, half-starved, bedless race. I saw not a tall person amongst them. The scent of dirt and train oil they carried with them was enough to spoil the appetite of any European. Consequently, none were invited to join the festivities. They had European knives, cloth, handkerchiefs, etc., showing they had been in communication with white men, and Forster notes they had canoes, which could not have been made in the neighbourhood, for there was no timber of sufficient size. Cape Horn Corrected Cape Horn was passed on the 29th of December, and Cook made his longitude 68 degrees 13 minutes west, a little too far to the westward. It should have been 67 degrees 16 minutes west. This is absolutely correct according to Wharton. On the 1st of January 1775, they landed on a small island of Staten Island and then put into a fine sheltered harbour on the main island which consequently was named New Year Harbour. The weather proved unfavourable for surveying, but enough was ascertained to convince them that the Tierra de Fiego and Staten Island coasts were not so dangerous to navigation as they had been represented. On the 3rd of January, they left to look for Dalrymple's Gulf of Sebastian, which Cook thought was non-existent, and on the 6th, they reached the position given on the chart, but could find no signs of any land. Bearing up to the north, Georgia Island was seen on the 14th, and was found to be entirely covered with snow, creating surprise as it was now the height of summer. The ship ran in between Georgia and Willis Islands, and possession was formally taken of the group though Cook did not think that anyone would ever be benefited by the discovery. Working as far south as 60 degrees, he turned to the east, being tired of these high northern latitudes, where nothing was to be found but ice and thick fogs, and a long hollow swell coming from the westward convinced him that he was correct in his assumption that the Gulf of Sebastian and a large body of land did not exist. On the 30th, two large islands were seen, and then three rocky islets to the north. The largest was named Friesland Peak, after the sailor who sighted it, S. Friesland. And behind these was an elevated coast, which received the name of Southern Thule, as being the most southerly land then discovered. The position of the ship was taken as 59 degrees 13 minutes 30 seconds south, 27 degrees 45 minutes west. During the early part of February, they ran down east between 58 and 59 degrees south, frequently having to throw the ship up into the wind to shake the snow out of her sails, for the weather was very bad. After another unsuccessful attempt to find Cape Circumcision, the ship's head was turned towards the Cape of Good Hope on the 23rd of February, and Cook had the satisfaction of feeling 
he had solved the problem of the non-existence of any southern continent except in close proximity to the pole he firmly believed from his observations of the ice fields that such a continent in the far south did exist but he asserted that further exploration in that direction would be of little service to navigation and would be hardly worth the cost and danger that must be incurred on the sixteenth of march two dutch ships were seen staring to the west and a boat was sent off to the nearest which proved to be the bounkirk polder from bengal they were offered any supplies the dutchman had notwithstanding the latter was rather short owing to his being some time out from port some english sailors on board told of the adventure having been at the cape of good hope some twelve months previously and that she had reported the massacre of a boat's crew in new zealand at the same time three or more sail came up one an english ship did not intend to call at the cape so cook forwarded by her a letter to the admiralty and received some provisions and most valuable gift a packet of old newspapers on the twenty second the resolution anchored in table bay saluting the dutch flag with thirteen guns and the next morning cook waited on the governor who did everything he could to assist him and render his stay agreeable three on the sick list cook was greatly pleased to be able to report three men only on the sick list and the remainder were granted as much leave as the refitting of the ship would permit the rigging of course had suffered severely and had to be replaced at an exorbitant cost from the government stores but cook calls attention to the state of the masts which he considered after sailing some twenty thousand leagues bore testimony to the care and ability of his officers and men and also to the high qualities of his ship monsieur de crozet put in on his way to Pontichery, and was impressed with cook's courtesy and qualifications as an explorer he was able to give the first information of monsieur de serville's voyage and that he had cleared away a mistake cook had made in assuming that the new caledonia reef extended to the great barrier reef on the east of australia forster says that cook pointedly avoided having any intercourse with any of the spaniards who were there but gives no reason for it he also bought a quantity of wild animals and birds many of which died before reaching england and he roundly but unjustly accused the crew of having killed them touching at st helena where kendall's watch was found to differ by about two miles from the observations of mason and dixon at the cape and those of masculine at st helena he proceeded to ascension where he obtained a good supply of fresh turtle and then to fernando de noranjo fixing the position as three degrees fifty minutes south thirty two degrees thirty four minutes west and crossed the line on the eleventh of june calling in at the azores land was sighted near plymouth on the twenty ninth and the next day they anchored at spithead and cook wales hodges and the two forsters immediately started for london having been away from england three years and eighteen days during this time they had lost four men three from accident and one from disease a record unprecedented in the annals of british naval history the war with the american colonies was naturally occupying the attention of the public but the newspapers found space to publish more or less authentic information as to their arrival and proceedings on the voyage one paper gravely said captain cook will be anointed admiral of the blue and command a fleet which is preparing to go out in the spring as a reward for the discoveries he has made in his last voyage in the south seas 
On the 9th of August, Cook was summoned to St. James Palace and had a long audience with the King, presenting several charts and maps and submitting several drawings, some of which were ordered to be engraved for the private museum. In return, the King presented him with his commission as post-captain and his appointment to HMS Kent. The commission signed by Sandwich, Penton and Palliser bears the date of the 9th of August. Furneaux had made captain. He sailed for America in October and was present at the attack on New Orleans in 1777. He died at the age of 46, some four years later. Kemp, Cooper and Clerk were promoted to commanders, and Isaac Smith, lieutenant. Mr. Wales was appointed mathematical master at Christ's Hospital, and Charles Lamb mentions him as having been a severe man, but a perpetual fund of humour, a constant glee about him, heightened by an inveterate provincialism of North Country dialect, absolutely took away the sting from his severities. Mr. Forster was received by the King at Kew, and was afterwards presented to the Queen, to whom he gave some of the birds bought at the Cape. He also attracted attention from another quarter, for Lloyd's Evening Post reports that on the 6th of August his house at Paddington was broke open and robbed of effects of considerable value. Again the Morning Post, 23rd of August, reports, Monday night, as Mr. John Reynold Forster was returning from Chelsea in a post-chase, he was attacked by three highwaymen near Bloody Bridge, who robbed him of three guineas and a watch set with diamonds. Greenwich Hospital Acting on advice from the Admiralty, Cook on the 12th of August applied for the position of one of the captains of Greenwich Hospital vacant through the death of Captain Clements, stipulating that if occasion arose in which his services would be of use elsewhere, he might be permitted to resign. This application was immediately granted, and his appointment is dated on the same day as his application. The salary was £200 per year, with a residence and certain small allowances, such as fire and light, and one shilling and two pence per day, table money. It is apparent from his letters that though he may have taken over some of the duties, but that is improbable owing to his time being fully occupied, preparing his journal for the press, and then making arrangements for his final voyage, he never entered upon residence, but remained at Mile End. He, however, found time to write two letters to Mr. Walker of Whitby, in the first of which he speaks rather despondingly of being confined within the limits of Greenwich Hospital, which are far too small for an active mind like mine, and in the second he gives a rapid sketch of the voyage, which by its clear conciseness proves the worthlessness of Mr. Forster's sneer, repeated by later writers, that the public account of the voyage owed more to the editing of Canon Douglas than to the writing of Cook. Soon after Cook's arrival in London, Furneaux handed him his journal of the proceedings of the adventure from the time of their separation off the coast of New Zealand. They were blown off the land near Table Cape in the beginning of November 1773 again sighting it near Cape Palliser, only to be blown off again, their sails and rigging suffering severely. They put into Tolago Bay for temporary repairs and water, and left again on the 13th, but had to put back till the 16th, and even then the weather was so bad they did not reach Queen Charlotte's Sound till the 30th, when the bottle left by Cook was at once found telling they were six days too late. They pushed on as rapidly as possible with the refit, and then were further delayed by finding a large quantity of bread required rebaking, 
but they were ready to sail on the 17th of December. Mr. Rowe was sent out with a boat to get a supply of vegetables, and the ship was to have sailed the following day, but the boat did not return. Burney was then sent off with a party of marines in search, and after a time discovered the missing men had been all killed and some of them eaten by the Maoris. Portions of the bodies were found and identified, Rowe's hand by an old scar. Tom Hill's hand had been tattooed in Otaheite. Captain Furno's servant's hand and midshipman Woodhouse's shoes were found and a portion of the boat. The natives who had these remains were fired on, but Burney could take no further steps, for he estimated there were 1,500 of the natives near the place. Furno believed that the attack was unpremeditated, as the Maoris had been quite friendly, and both he and Cook had been at the place during their previous visit. He concluded that some sudden quarrel had arisen, and the boat's crew had been incautious. Massacre On his next voyage, Cook obtained an account of the affairs from the natives, when they said that the crew was at dinner, and some of the Maoris attempted to steal some bread and fish, whilst one tried to get something from the boat, which had been left in charge of the captain's black servant. The thieves were given a thrashing, and a quarrel arose, during which two muskets were discharged and two natives were shot. The Maoris then closed in and killed all the sailors immediately. The Yorkshire Gazette of the 4th of June 1887 states that it was reported that a midshipman escaped the massacre, and after many wanderings reached England in 1777. If this improbable story is true, he must have been Mr. Woodhouse, whose shoes were found, for he was the only midshipman in the boat. On the 23rd of December, the adventure sailed, but owing to contrary winds, did not get away from the coast for some days. She stood southeast till 56 degrees south was reached, and then the cold being extreme and the sea high, her course was set for the horn reaching as high as 61 degrees south with a favourable wind. Stores were running short, so after an unsuccessful search for Cape Circumcision, she sailed for Table Bay, and having refitted, again left on the 16th of April for England, and dropped her anchor at Spithead on the 14th of July, 1774. Mr Forster states, that this second voyage of Cook cost £25,000, but does not give the source of his information. End of chapter 14Seventeen seventy five to seventeen seventy six England After his return, Cook was busily engaged preparing his journal and charts for publication, which had been sanctioned by the Admiralty, and was considerably annoyed and delayed by the conduct of Mr Forster, who immediately on his return complained that the four thousand pounds granted him to cover the whole of his expenses had proved totally inadequate. He claimed that Lord Sandwich had promised, verbally, that he was to have the exclusive duty of writing the history of the voyage, was to receive the whole of the profits thereof, and to be provided with permanent employment for the remainder of his life. This promise was totally denied by Lord Sandwich, and it certainly does not appear to have been a reasonable one to make on behalf of the Admiralty. After a protracted discussion, it was agreed that Cook should write the account of the voyage and the countries visited, whilst Forster was to write a second volume containing his observations as a scientist. The Admiralty was to pay the expenses of engraving the charts, pictures, etc., 
and on completion of the work, the plates were to be equally divided between Cook and Forster. Cook was to proceed with his part at once and submit it to Forster for revision, and Forster was to draw up a plan of the method he intended to pursue and forward it to Lord Sandwich for approval. Cook proceeded to carry out his share and furnished Forster with a large amount of manuscript, but the latter proved obstinately insistent on having his own way in everything, with the result that after submitting two schemes to Lord Sandwich, both extremely unsatisfactory, he was forbidden to write at all, and it was decided that Cook should complete the whole of the work, and it should be revised by the Reverend John Douglas, Canon of Windsor, afterwards Bishop of Carlisle. Forster's Yarns Notwithstanding the prohibition against Forster, a book was published under his son's name, and the latter claims he started on the voyage with the intention of writing, took copious notes, and accepting that he utilised those taken by his father, the work was entirely his own. He forgets, however, to say that a quantity of Cook's manuscripts had been in his father's hands, and does not explain how so much of his book corresponds with curious exactitude with that of Cook, in many cases word for word, and how, when the papers of Cook failed to provide him with further facts, he was obliged to rely on would-be philosophical dissertations which it is to be hoped were not obtained from his father's notebooks. Young Forster says that the appointment was first of all given to his father in a spirit of pique on the part of Lord Sandwich, and then the order forbidding him to write was made because the father had refused to give Miss Ray, Lord Sandwich's mistress, who had admired them when on board the ship, some birds brought from the Cape of Good Hope as a present to the Queen. In the end, the Forsters forestalled Cook's book by about six weeks, and as this was after Cook had left England on his last voyage, Mr. Wales undertook the defence of the absent against the sneers and insinuations that were plentifully given out all round. The Forsters infer that Cook was unreliable because he suppresses mention of the bombardment of the Loo Fort at Madeira, an event which never happened, and because he places Valparaiso, where he had never been, in the position given on by the Admiralty chart supplied to him, which proved to be some ten degrees out. The master, who had refused to give up his cabin, was of course never forgiven, and as for Mr. Wales, who had observed the transit of Venus at Hudson's Bay in 1769 for the Royal Society, he, poor man, had neither knowledge nor experience in astronomical science. The crews of the two ships also, carefully selected men though they were, some of whom had been the previous voyage, were morally and physically bad and utterly incapable of performing their duty in a proper and seamanlike manner. A little allowance must be made for the two authors, for the father suffered severely from rheumatism, the son was of a scorbutic tendency, and both were unaccustomed to sea life, and doubtless the hardships inseparable from such a voyage pressed heavily on them. A second journal was published by F. Newbury, about the same time, and Cook, hearing of it, sent Anderson, the gunner, to find out the author. With little difficulty, he was found to be Mara, the gunner's mate, who tried to desert at Otaheite, and the publication was stayed till after the authorised version was out. A volume of Cook's letters to Dr. Douglas relating to the preparation of his journal for the press is preserved at the British Museum, and it shows how Cook, to the very last, endeavoured to serve Mr. Forster's interests and to smooth matters over so that they could work together. The last one Dr. Douglas received before Cook's departure was dated from Mile End, 
23rd of June 1776, the day before he joined his ship at the Nore. Dear Sir, it is now settled that I am to publish without Mr. Forster, and I have taken my measures accordingly. When Captain Campbell has looked over the manuscript, it will be put into the hands of Mr. Strahan and Mr. Stewart to be printed and I shall hope for the continuation of your assistance in correcting the press. I know not how to recompense you for the trouble you have had and will have in the work. I can only beg you will accept of as many copies after it is published as will serve yourself and friends, and I have given directions for you to be furnished with them. When you have done with the introduction, please send it to Mr. Strahan or bring it with you when you come to town, for there needs be no hurry about it. Tomorrow morning I set out to join my ship at the Nore, and with her proceed to Plymouth, where my stay will be but short. Permit me to assure you that I shall always have a due sense of the favour you have done me, and that I am with great esteem and regard, dear sir, your obliged and very humble servant. James Cook. Notwithstanding the Forsters' endeavour to discount its success by forestalling the publication by some weeks, Cook's work was well received by the public, and Mrs. Cook, to whom the whole of the profits were given, reaped considerable benefit from its sale. Fellow of Royal Society On the 29th of February, 1776, Captain James Cook was unanimously elected a Fellow of the Royal Society, and his certificate of election was signed by no less than 26 of the Fellows. He was formally admitted on the 17th of March, on which date a paper written by him on the means he had used for the prevention and cure of scurvy was read that he valued his success in dealing with this disease, which at that time, even in voyages of very moderate length, was the most terrible danger to be encountered, is plainly set forth in his journal of the voyage. He says, But whatever may be the public judgment about other matters, it is with real satisfaction and without claiming any merit, but that of attention to my duty, that I can conclude this account with an observation which facts enable me to make, that our having discovered the possibility of preserving health amongst a numerous ship's company for such a length of time in such varieties of climate and amidst such continued hardships and fatigues will make this voyage remarkable in opinion of every benevolent person when the disputes about a southern continent shall have ceased to engage the attention and to divide the judgment of philosophers. During his early days at sea, it was no unusual thing for a man of war to be short-handed through scurvy after a cruise of a few weeks, and in a voyage across the Atlantic, as many as 20% of the crew are known to have perished, to give some of his own experiences to the Navy, on the 4th of June, 1756, HMS Eagle arrived in Plymouth Sound after cruising for two months in the Channel and off the French coast, and Captain Palliser reported landing 130 sick, buried at sea 22, and since his arrival in port, his surgeon and four men had died, and both his surgeon's mates were very ill, this out of a complement of four hundred. Boscarwin, sailing from Halifax for Louisbourg in 1758, left several ships behind on account of scurvy, one being the Pembroke, of which Cook was master. She had lost twenty-nine men crossing the Atlantic, but she was able to rejoin before the others as they were in a worse plight. Wolfe reported to Lord George Sackville that some of the regiments employed at Louisbourg had 300 or 400 men eat up with scurvy. 
of the Northumberland when at Halifax, Lord Colville wrote that frozen, fresh beef from Boston kept his men healthy when in port, but the scurvy never fails to put us down in great numbers upon our going to sea in spring. Having had such experiences, Cook appears to have made up his mind to fight the dreadful scourge from the very first, and though the popular idea is that he only turned his mind to it during the second voyage, it is very evident that on the endeavour he fought it successfully, and it is most probable would have laid claim to victory had it not been for the serious losses incurred through the malarial fever and its usual companion dysentery contracted at Batavia. In proof of this, reference may be made to the report of Mr. Peary, surgeon's mate, and after Mr. Monkhouse's death, surgeon on board. He states they rounded the horn with the crew as free from scurvy as on our sailing from Plymouth, that is, after five months. He reports, for the whole of the voyage, five cases of scurvy, three in port at New Holland, and two while on the coast of New Zealand. Not a man more suffered any convenience from this distemper. He was one of the five cases, but at the same time it must not be understood that no others developed symptoms of scurvy, only they were so closely watched and at once subjected to such treatment that the disease was not able to gain the upper hand. Cook wrote to the Secretary of the Admiralty immediately after his arrival at Batavia, saying, I have not lost one man from sickness. He means here, as elsewhere in his journals, sickness to be taken as scurvy, and at that time he had lost only seven men, two of Mr. Banks' servants from exposure, three men drowned, Mr. Buchan, a fit probably apoplectic, and one man, alcoholic poisoning. He arrived at home with a total loss of 41, including Tupia and his boy. 32 of these deaths were from fever and dysentery, and two, Mr. Hicks and Sutherland, from consumption. Treatment of Scurvy The chief antiscorbutics used on the endeavour according to Mr. Perry's report, were sauerkraut, mustard, vinegar, wheat, whole, inspissated orange and lemon juice, salop, portable soup, sugar, molasses, vegetables, at all times when they could possibly be got, were some in constant, others in occasional use. Salop was a decoction made from the orchis muscular root, a common meadow plant, or else from sassafras, and was at one time sold in the streets as a drink before the introduction of tea and coffee. In the United Service Museum there is a cake of the portable soup, which was on board the Endeavour, in appearance like a square of whitish glue, which in effect it is says Sir John Pringle, President of the Royal Society. Mr. Perry continues, Cold bathing was encouraged and enforced by example. The allowance of salt beef and pork was abridged from nearly the beginning of the voyage, and the usual custom of the sailors mixing the salt beef fat with the flour was strictly forbidden. Salt butter and cheese was stopped on leaving England and throughout the voyage raisins were issued in place of the salt suet. In addition to the malt, wild celery was collected in Tierra de Fiego, and every morning breakfast was made from this herb, ground wheat and portable soup. Of the personal cleanliness of the crew, which Cook looked upon as of the first importance, Mara says, when writing of the resolution's voyage, he was very particular, never suffering any to appear dirty before him, insomuch that when other commanders came on board, they could not help declaring they thought every day Sunday on board of Captain Cook. He inspected the men at least once a week, 
and saw they had changed their clothing and were dry. The bedding was dried and aired when occasion offered, and the whole ship was stove-dried, special attention being paid to the well, into which an iron pot containing a fire was lowered. Fresh water was obtained when possible, for Cook remarks, Nothing contributes more to the health of seamen than having plenty of water. He was provided with a condenser, but it was too small and unsatisfactory, and he looked upon it as a useful invention, but only calculated to provide enough to preserve life without health. He attributed the losses on the adventure to Furno's desire to save his men's labour, and neglected to avail himself of every opportunity of obtaining fresh water. Cook throughout the voyage was never short of water. Furno was on two or three occasions. Dr. McBride advises the use of fresh wort made from malt as an anti-scorbutic, and the endeavour was ordered to give it a thorough trial. Fresh ground malt was treated with boiling water and allowed to stand. Then the liquid was boiled with dried fruit or biscuit into a pandana, and the patient had one or two meals with a quart or more of the liquid per diem. This treatment was favourably reported on, but at the same time, so many other precautions were taken that it was not possible to say which was the most successful. Banks, who was threatened, tried the wart, but thinking it affected his throat, substituted a weak punch of lemon juice and brandy, which had satisfactory results. After a time the malt, though dry and sweet, had lost much strength, so as strong a wart was made as possible, and ground wheat boiled with it for breakfast, a very pleasant mess which the people were fond of, and Cook had great reason to think that the people received much benefit from it. Sauerkraut Cook set great store on the sauerkraut, and says, The men at first would not eat it, until I put it in practice, a method I never once knew to fail with seamen, and this was to have some of it dressed every day for the cabin table, and permitted all the officers, without exception, to make use of it, and left it to the option of the men to take as much as they pleased, or none at all. But this practice was not continued above a week before I found it necessary to put every one on board to an allowance, for such are the tempers and disposition of seamen in general, that whatever you give them out of the common way, although it be ever so much for their good, it will not go down, and you will hear nothing but murmurings against the man that first invented it. But the moment they see their superiors set a value upon it, it becomes the finest stuff in the world, and the inventor is an honest fellow. A pound of this was served to each man twice a week at sea, or oftener if thought necessary portable soup at the rate of an ounce per man was boiled with the peas thrice a week and when vegetables could be obtained it was boiled with them and wheat or oatmeal for breakfast with peas and vegetables for dinner and it was the means of making the people eat a greater quantity of vegetables than they would otherwise have done the rub of lemon and orange was a doubtful quantity for though Cook had no great confidence in its efficacy, Furno reported very favourably on its use, but it was expensive. Of vinegar, Cook was of opinion that it was of little service, and preferred smoking the ship with wood fires to washing with vinegar, which had been strongly advised. He substituted sugar for oil, as he esteemed it a very good anti-scorbutic, whereas oil, such as the navy is usually supplied with, I am of the opinion has a contrary effect. Cook says that the introduction of the most salutary articles would prove unsuccessful 
unless accompanied by strict regulations, so the crew were divided into three watches, except on some extraordinary occasion, in order that they might not be so exposed to the weather, and had a better chance to get into dry clothes if they happened to get wet. Hammocks, bedding, clothes, and ship were kept as clean and dry as possible, and when the ship could not be cured with fires, once or twice a week she was smoked with gunpowder, mixed with vinegar or water. To cleanliness, as well in the ship as amongst the people, too great attention cannot be paid. The least neglect occasions a putrid and disagreeable smell below, which nothing but the fires will remove. He finishes his paper, read before the Royal Society, as follows. We came to few places where either the art of man or the bounty of nature had not provided some sort of refreshment or other, either in the animal or vegetable way. It was my first care to procure whatever of any kind could be met with, by every means in my power and to oblige our people to make use thereof, both of my example and authority. But the benefits arising from refreshments of any kind soon became so obvious that I had little occasion to recommend the one or exert the other. Copley Gold Medal On the 30th of November, 1776, Sir John Pringle, President of the Royal Society, in his address to the Fellows, announced that the Copley Gold Medal had been conferred on Captain Cook for his paper on the treatment of scurvy, and gave some corroborative facts which had come under his own observation, concluding his speech as follows. If Rome decreed the civic crown to him who saved the life of a single citizen, what wreaths were due to this man, who, having himself saved many, perpetuates in your transactions the means by which Britain may now, on the most distant voyages, preserve numbers of her intrepid sons, her mariners, who, braving every danger, have so liberally contributed to the fame, to the opulence, and to the maritime empire for this country." Before Cook left England on his last voyage, he had been informed that the medal had been conferred on him, but he never received it, and it was presented to Mrs. Cook, and is now in the British Museum. During May 1776, Cook sat for his portrait, now in the painted hall, Greenwich, to Sir Nathaniel Dance. There are several portraits of him in existence, three by Weber, one being in the National Portrait Gallery, one by Hodges, and one or two others by unknown artists. Mr. Samwell, surgeon on the third voyage, says of an engraving by Sherwin from the portrait by Dance that it is a most excellent likeness of Captain Cook and more to be valued as it is the only one I have seen that bears any resemblance to him. This portrait of dancers represents Cook dressed in his captain's uniform, seated at a table on which is a chart. The figure is evidently that of a tall man. He is over six feet in height, with brown unpowdered hair neatly tied back from the face. The clear complexion shows little effect of exposure to the sea breezes, the pleasant brown eyes look from under rather prominent brows, the nose rather long, and a good firm mouth. The whole face gives a very pleasant impression of the man, and conveys the idea that it was a good likeness. Cook Volunteers Omai, a native of Otaheite, was brought to England by Ferno, was introduced to the king, made much of in society, was painted by Reynolds, Dance and Hodges, and seems to have conducted himself fairly well. He was to be sent back to his own country, and from the orders given to the resolution, when she returned, 
it was evident she was to be the ship to take him. There was some difficulty as to the man to take command of the new expedition, as the Admiralty felt they could not send out Cook again so soon after his return. However, early in February 1776, he was invited to dine with Lord Sandwich to meet Sir Hugh Palliser and Mr. Stevens, the secretary, when the proposed expedition was discussed and the difficulty of finding a commander was brought forward. It is said that after some conversation, Cook jumped up and declared he would go, and as a result of this resolve, he called at the Admiralty office on the 10th of February and made formal application for the command, which was accepted on the same day, and he there and then went to Deptford and hoisted his pendant on the resolution. Her complement was the same as the previous voyage, that is, 112 men, including 12 marines, and the quarter bill, preserved in the records office, shows the stations and duties of each of the crew, and the positions of the civilians who, in cases of necessity, were expected to take their places as small arms men. The companionship, the discovery, was built by Langbourne of Whitby, and was purchased for £2,450 from W. Herbert of Scarborough. According to the records, she was 229 tonnes burthen, but Cook puts her down as 300 tonnes, and Burney says the two ships were splendid sailing company, any advantage there might be resting with the discovery. The command was given to Charles Clerk, who had been both the previous voyages. The resolution hauled out of dock 10th of March, completed her rigging and took in stores and provisions, which was as much as we could stow and the best of every kind that could be got. On the 6th of May, the pilot went on board to take her down to Longreach for her guns and powder, but owing to contrary winds, she did not reach there until the 30th. On the 8th of June, she was visited by Lord Sandwich, Sir Hugh Palliser, and others from the Admiralty, to see that everything was completed to their desire and to the satisfaction of all who were to embark in the voyage. A bull, two cows and their calves, with some sheep, were embarked as a present from King George to the Otahitians in hopes to start stocking the island. A good supply of trade was shipped. The extra warm clothing for the crew was supplied by the Admiralty, and nothing was wanting that was thought conducive to either conveniency or health. Such was the extraordinary care taken by those at the head of the naval departments. Cook and King were to take observations on the resolution, and Bailey, who was with the adventure the previous voyage, was appointed as astronomer to the discovery, the necessary instruments being supplied by the Board of Longitude, the chronometer made by Kendall, which had given such satisfaction last voyage, was again on board the Resolution. It was afterwards with Bly on the Bounty, sold by Adams after the mutiny to an American, who sold it again to Chile. It was then purchased for £52.10, shillings, repaired and rated, and after keeping fair time for some years, was presented by Admiral Sir Thomas Hubert to the United Service Museum and is still in working order. Clerk in the Fleet On the 15th of June, the two ships sailed for the Nore. There, the resolution waited for her captain, whilst the discovery under the command of Burney went on to Plymouth but meeting with damage in a gale, had to put into Portland for temporary repairs. Captain Clerk was detained in London in the rules of the bench, as he had been financially responsible for a friend who left him in the lurch. He wrote to Banks, saying, The Jews are exasperated and determined to spare no pains to arrest me. It appears that he contracted the illness which led to his death at that period. 
End of chapter 15Chapter number 16, part 1 of The Life of Captain James Cook, the Circumnavigator, by Arthur Kitson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter number 16, part 1, 1776 to 1777. Third Voyage. On the 24th of June, Cook and Omai joined the ship at the Nore, leaving next day for Plymouth arriving there on the 30th, three days after the discovery. On the 8th of July, the final orders, which Cook had helped to draw up, were received. They were to the effect that he was to proceed, by the Cape of Good Hope, to look for some islands said to have been seen by the French in latitude 48 degrees, about the longitude of Mauritius, to touch at New Zealand, if he thought proper, and then to proceed to Otaheite and leave Omai there, or at the Society Islands, as the latter might wish. Leaving Otaheite about February, he was to strike the North American coast in about 45 degrees latitude, avoiding, if possible, touching at any of the Spanish dominions, and proceeding northwards to explore any rivers or inlets that seemed likely to lead to the Hudson's or Baffin's Bay. For the winter he was to proceed to the port of St. Peter and St. Paul in Kamchatska, or other suitable place, and in the ensuing spring he was again to try and find a passage either to the east or west. Failing that, the ships were then to return to England. A reward of £20,000 had been offered to any British merchant ship that discovered a passage between Hudson's Bay and the Pacific, and now this offer was thrown open to any ship flying the British flag, and the passage might be to the east or west so long as it was north of latitude 52 degrees. On the 9th of July, the Marines, who had been carefully selected, embarked under the command of Lieutenant Molesworth Phillips and the following day officers and men were paid up to the 30th of June, and petty officers and seamen received in addition two months' advance. The Resolution Sails The Resolution sailed on the 12th of July, the crew looking on it as a lucky day, being the anniversary of the day they had sailed on the last voyage, but, as Clerk had not yet arrived, the discovery remained behind. Putting into Tenerife, Cook purchased a supply of wine, which he did not think as good as that of Madeira, but remarks that the best Tenerife wine was £12 a pipe, whereas the best Madeira is seldom under £27. Here they met Captain Bordat, the Chevalier de Borda, who was making observations in order to time two watch machines, and were afforded an opportunity of comparing them with their own. Looking into Port Praya in hopes to find the discovery, they crossed the line on the 1st of September in longitude 27 degrees, 38 minutes west, and sighted the Cape of Good Hope on the 17th of October, anchoring in Table Bay the next day. The ship was found to be very leaky in her upper works, as the great heat had opened up her seams, which had been badly corked at first. Hardly a man could lie dry in his bed. The officers in the gun-room were all driven out of their cabin by the water that came in through the sides. The sails were damaged, some being quite ruined before they could be dried. The reception accorded by the Dutch was all that could be desired, and all the resources of the place were at Cook's disposal. Letters were sent to England, and one invalid, Cook wishing afterwards that he had sent one or two more, but he had at the time hopes of their complete recovery. On the 31st of October, they were unable to communicate with the shore owing to a heavy southeasterly gale, which did not blow itself out for three days, 
and the Resolution was the only ship in the bay that rode through it without dragging her anchors. On the 10th of November, the Discovery arrived, having left Plymouth on the 1st of August. She sighted land above 25 leagues north of Table Bay, but had been blown off the coast in the storm. It may be noted here that the French, Spanish and United States governments issued instructions to their naval officers that Captain Cook and his ships were to be treated with every respect and as belonging to neutral and allied power. In honour to Cook and also to the nations who conferred it on him. When her consort arrived, Cook was almost ready for sea, so the refit of the discovery was pushed on as quickly as possible, but some delay arose in the delivery of bread ordered. Cook says he believes the bakers would not put it in hand till they saw the discovery safely at anchor. However, on the 30th of November, Clerk was handed his instructions, and the two captains went on board their respective ships to find them fully supplied for a voyage, which was expected to last at least two years. Livestock had been purchased at the Cape, and one journalist says that on leaving, the resolution reminded him of Noah's Ark. They did not get clear of the coast till the 3rd of December, owing to light winds, and then on the 6th, a sudden heavy squall cost the Resolution her mizzen topmast, not a very serious loss, for they had a spare stick, and the broken one had often complained. But Burney says that owing to the weather, it took them three days to complete the repairs. The cold, rough weather had also a bad effect on the livestock, several of them perishing. Dense Fog on the 12th of December, the islands discovered by Marion du Frisne and Crozet in 1772 were sighted, and as they were unnamed in the map, dated 1775, given by Crozet to Cook, he called them Prince Edward's Islands, and a small group further to the east was named Marion and Crozet Islands. Then, sailing south through fog so dense, that, Burney says, they were often for hours together unable to see twice the length of the ship, and though it was the height of summer, the cold was so intense that the warm clothing had to be resorted to. They sighted Kerguelen's land on the 24th of December. The Chevalier de Borda had given Cook 48 degrees 26 minutes south 64 degrees 57 minutes east of Paris, as the position of the Rendezvous Islands. This cook took to be an isolated rock they had only just weathered in the fog, to which he gave the name of Bly's Cap, for he said, I know nothing that can rendezvous at it but fowls of the air, for it is certainly inaccessible to every other animal. Cook, unaware that Kerglian had paid two visits to the place, found some difficulty in recognising the places described. The country was very desolate, the coarse grass hardly worth cutting for the animals, no wood, but a good supply of water was obtained, and here the Christmas day was spent on the 27th, as the 25th and 26th had been full of hard work. A bottle was found by one of the crew containing a parchment record of the visit of the French in 1772. On the back, Cook noted the names of his ships and the year of their visit and added a silver twopenny piece of 1772, replaced it in the bottle which was sealed with lead and hidden in a pile of stones in such a position that it could not escape the notice of any one visiting the spot. Running along the coast to the southeast, they encountered very blowy weather, and finding the land even more desolate than that at Christmas Harbour, they left on the 31st for New Zealand. Anderson, the surgeon, on whom Cook relied for his notes on natural history, says, Perhaps no place hitherto discovered in either hemisphere under the same parallel of latitude, 
afford so scanty a field for the naturalist as this barren spot. The whole catalogue of plants, including lichens, did not exceed 16 or 18. A Southerly Buster The first part of January 1777 was foggy, and Cook says that they ran above 300 leagues in the dark. On the 19th, a squall carried away the fore topmast and main topgallant mast, and it took the whole day to replace the first, but they had nothing suitable for the topgallant mast. On the 26th of January, they put into Adventure Bay, Van Diemen's Land, and obtained a spar. Cook spoke of the timber as being good but too heavy. A few natives were seen, but did not create a favourable impression. Still, Cook landed a couple of pigs in hopes to establish the breed, a hope doomed to be unsatisfied. The Marquis de Beauvoir relates that in 1866 he saw in Adventure Bay a tree on which was cut with a knife, Cook, 26th of January 1777, and he was informed it had been cut by the man himself. They seem to have seen nothing to raise a doubt about Furneaux's conclusion that Van Diemen's land formed a part of Australia, so no attempt was made to settle the question, and they sailed for New Zealand on the 30th, meeting with a perfect storm from the south. The thermometer rose almost in an instant from about 70 degrees to near 90 degrees, but fell again when the wind commenced. In fact, the change was so rapid that there were some on board who did not notice it. These storms are of frequent occurrence and are locally known as southerly busters. On the 10th of February, Rocks Point near Cape Farewell was sighted and on the 12th they anchored near their old berth in Queen Charlotte Sound and a camp was immediately established. Here they were visited by a few of the natives, some of whom remembered Cook and were recognised by him. At first they thought he had come to avenge the adventure's losses, but after a time were persuaded to put aside their distrust, and they flocked down to the shore, every available piece of ground being quickly occupied by their huts. Cook describes how one party worked. The ground was selected the men tearing up the grass and plants and erecting the huts, whilst the women looked after the canoes, properties and provisions, and collected firewood, and he kept the children and some of the oldest of the party out of mischief by scrambling the contents of his pockets amongst them. At the same time, he noticed that however busy the men might be, they took care to be within easy reach of their weapons, and he, on his side, had a strong party of marines on duty, and any party working at a distance from the ship was always armed and under the command of an officer experienced in dealing with the natives. Cook was pleased to notice his men were not inclined to associate with the Maldives, and he always tried to discourage familiarity between his crew and the natives of the islands he visited, it is worthy of remark that two of the resolution were on the sick list whilst the discovery had a clean bill of health. One of their constant visitors was a man Cook calls Kahura, who was pointed out as having been the leader at the massacre of the adventure's men, and it was a matter of surprise to the natives that having him in his power, Cook did not kill him. But after the fullest possible inquiry, Cook believed it was best to let matters rest, as the attack had evidently arisen out of a sudden quarrel and was totally unpremeditated. Burney thinks the Maoris felt a certain contempt for the English, either because they were too generous in their dealings or else because the murders were unavenged. The gardens that had been made at the last visit had in some respects prospered, in particular, the potatoes from the Cape had improved in quality, but as they had been appreciated by the natives, there were few to be got. Burney, on the other hand, declares that nothing could be heard of the pigs and fowls that had been left. Omai was anxious to take a New Zealander away with him, 
and soon found one to volunteer. It was explained that he must make up his mind that he would not be able to return, and as he seemed satisfied, he and a boy were taken. When they were seasick, they deeply and loudly lamented leaving their home, but on recovery they soon became as firmly attached to us as if they had been born amongst us. The Weekly Paper Sailing on the 25th of February, they crossed the tropic on the 27th of March, some nine degrees further west than Cook wished to have done, and had seen nothing of importance. It is interesting to note that Burney says each ship published a weekly paper, and on signal being made, a boat was sent to exchange when possible. He says Cook was a constant reader, but not a contributor. It is to be regretted that no copies exist of this, probably the first oceanic weekly. On the 29th of March, a small island Cook calls Manganuya was discovered in 21 degrees 57 minutes south, 201 degrees 53 minutes east. Burney gives 21 degrees 54 minutes south, 202 degrees 6 minutes east. But the landing places were too dangerous on account of the surf. A native came on board who was able to converse with Omai and said they had plenty of plantains and taro, but neither yams, hogs, nor dogs. He unfortunately fell over a goat, which he took to be a large bird, and was so frightened he had to be put ashore. The next day another island was seen, and as they were very short of fodder for the animals, Gore was sent to see if trade could be opened up with the inhabitants. In this he was fairly successful, and obtained a quantity of plantain stems, which were found to be a satisfactory substitute for grass. But the trading was not brisk, for the people wished to receive dogs in return, and it was evident that though they had none, they knew what they were. They were afraid of the horses and cattle, and took the sheep and goats for some kind of large birds. A party went ashore and were treated fairly well, but when they wished to return to their boats, all sorts of difficulties were raised, and Cook credits Omai with their safe return, for it seems he gave judiciously boastful replies to the many questions that were asked him, and at the psychological moment exploded a handful of powder, with the result that opposition to their departure was withdrawn. Burney says Omai was most useful in a landing party, as he was a good sportsman and cook, and was never idle. After this experience, Cook would not run further risks, so made a small uninhabited island where some vegetables were obtained, and branches of trees, which cut into short lengths, were eagerly eaten by the cattle. And Cook says, It might be said without impropriety that we fed our cattle on billet wood payment for what had been taken was left in a deserted village. On the 6th of April they reached Hervey's Island, and were somewhat surprised to be visited by several canoes, as on Cook's previous visit no signs of inhabitants had been noticed. Omai gathered from one or two natives who came on board to sell a few fish that the resolution and adventure had been seen in 1776 when passing the island. King was sent to look for a landing place, but seeing that the women were quietly bringing down arms to their menfolk on the beach, he thought it better to return to the ship, and the sail was made for the friendly islands, the discovery being sent on about a league ahead, as she was better able to claw off a lee shore than mine. At this time, Cook was getting rather short of water, so he set the still to work, and obtained about 13 to 16 gallons of fresh water between 6 a.m. and 4 p.m. There has lately been made some improvement, as they are pleased to call it, to this machine, which in my opinion is much for the worse. Falling in with repeated thunderstorms, in which they caught more water in an hour, than by the still in a month, 
I laid it aside as a thing attended with more trouble than profit. At one of the Palmerston group, they found, amongst other things drifted over the reef, some planks, one of which was very thick, with trunnel holes in it, and a piece of moulding from some ship's upper works, painted yellow, with nail holes showing signs of iron rust, probably the remains of some wrecked European ship. At Comango, where they anchored on the 28th of April, Cook notes, It was remarkable that during the whole day the Indians would hardly part with any one thing to anybody but me. Captain Clerk did not get above one or two hogs. A supply of water was obtained and wood was cut, but most of the trees were what Cook calls manchineal, the sap from which produced blisters on the men's skin, and Bernie says some of them were blind for a fortnight, having rubbed their faces with their dew-stained hands. One of the carpenters had a bad fall and broke his leg, before the rest, says Bernie, they were all in good health, thank God, no appearance of scurvy. Flogging no good. Cook again complains of the thefts committed so continually and says that no punishment they could devise was effectual, for flogging made no more impression than it would have done upon the mainmast. The chiefs would advise him to kill those caught but as he would not proceed to such a length, the culprits generally escaped unpunished. Here the Discovery lost her best bower anchor, the cable having been chaffed by the coral and parted when weighing. Burney describes how by pouring oil on the water, they were able to see and recover it from a depth of 17 fathoms. Landing on Happy, they were very well received, and obtained plentiful supplies of fresh food, which was most opportune. An entertainment of boxing, wrestling, and combats with clubs made from green coconut boughs was held in their honour, and Cook says that they were carried on with the greatest good humour in the presence of some 3,000 spectators, though some, women as well as men, having received blows they must feel some time after. When this was over, the chief, Finau, presented Cook with supplies that required four boats to take to the ships. It far exceeded any present I have ever before received from an Indian prince. The donor was invited on board to receive his return present, which proved so satisfactory that on his return to the shore, he forwarded still more in addition to his first gift and was amused by a drill of the marines and a display of fireworks, which, though some were spoilt, were the cause of astonishment and pleasure to the wandering natives. During one of his walks on shore, Cook saw a woman just completing a surgical operation on a child's eyes. She was removing a film growing over the eyeballs, and the instruments used were described as slender wooden probes. He was not able to say if the operation were successful. The chief, Finau, went off to an island about two days' sail away in order to obtain some of the feather caps which were held in high estimation, and Cook promised to wait for his return, but finding the fresh supplies were running short, he sailed along the south of the reef and put into a bay in Lifuga. On the way, the discovery ran on a shoal, but managed to back off without damage. Although he was not short of water, Cook went ashore to inspect some well, which he had been informed contained water of a very superior quality, but he found it very bad, and says, This will not be the only time I shall have to remark that these people do not know what good water is. Near these wells was a large artificial mound about 40 feet high and 50 feet diameter on the top, on which large trees were growing. At the foot was a hewn block of coral, 4 feet broad, 2.5 feet thick and 14 feet high, but the natives present said that there were only one half of it above ground. It was supposed to have been erected to the memory of a great chief, 
but how many years ago it was impossible to guess. King Palahu Whilst anchored here, a large sailing canoe arrived, having on board a chief who was treated by the natives with the utmost respect, and the visitors were given to understand that Tatafi Palahu was the king of all the islands. He was invited on board, and brought with him, as a present, two good fat hogs, though not as fat as himself, for he was the most corporate, plump fellow we had met with. I found him to be a sedate, sensible man. He viewed the ship and the several new objects with uncommon attention and asked several pertinent questions. In return, Cook was invited ashore, and when they were seated, the natives who had been trading submitted the articles they had received for Palaho's inspection, who inquired what each one had sold, and seemed pleased with the bargains made. Everything was returned to its owner except a red glass bowl to which the king had taken a great fancy. According to Mr. Basil Thompson, who was for some years in the Pacific Islands, a red glass bowl was given by the king of Tonga to the notorious Mr. Shirley Baker as a relic of Captain Cook, but was unfortunately broken in New Zealand. It was most probably the one in question. Before leaving, Palaho presented Cook with one of the red feather caps made from the tail feathers of a bird the Sandwich Islanders called Iwi, Vistaria Coicinia, which were evidently considered of extreme value. At the same time he gave Cook, Clerk and Omai some of the red feathers of parakeets which, though much in demand, were not to be purchased. On the 29th of May they sailed for Tongatabu, but the wind falling they nearly ran ashore on the 31st on a low sandy island, on which the sea was breaking very heavily. Fortunately, all hands had just been engaged in putting the ship about, so that the necessary movements were not only executed with judgment, but with alertness, and this alone saved the ship. Cook confesses that he was tired of beating about in these dangerous waters, and felt relieved to get back to his old anchorage off Anamuka. Finau here rejoined the ship, and his behaviour before Palaho was sufficient evidence as to the high position held by the latter, for he made a deep reverence to him, and afterwards would not eat or drink in his presence, but left the cabin as soon as dinner was announced. An Entertainment On the 6th of June they sailed for Tongitabu again, accompanied by some sailing canoes which could all easily outdistance the two ships. A good anchorage was found, and Cook's old friends, Otago and Tubal, were soon on board to greet them. As it was proposed to make a short stay, the cattle were landed, the observatory set up, and the sailmakers set to work to overhaul the sails, for much required repairs. Cook speaks very highly of the orderly behaviour of the natives, many of whom had never seen a white man before. Hearing much of an important chief named Mariwaji, Cook persuaded the king to escort a party to his residence, which was found to be pleasantly situated on an inlet where most of the chiefs resided, surrounded by neatly fenced plantations. But they were informed that Mariwaji had gone to see the ships. This was found to be untrue, but the next day he appeared, accompanied by a large number of both sexes, and Cook at once landed with some presents for him, only to find he was accompanied by another chief, to whom something had to be given as well. Fortunately, the two were easily satisfied, and the present was divided between them. Mariwaji was found to be the father of Finau, and the father-in-law of the king. He gave a grand entertainment of singing and dancing in honour of the strangers, which commenced about eleven in the morning and lasted till between three and four in the afternoon, 
and wound up with a presentation of a large number of yams, each pair of the roots being tied to a stick about six feet long and decorated with fish. Cook says it was hard to say which was the most valuable, the yams for food or the sticks for firewood, but as for the fish, it might serve to please the sight, but it was very offensive to the smell, as some of it had been kept two or three days for this occasion. More singing and dancing then took place, and then the English gave a display of fireworks, which astonished and highly entertained the natives. Being afraid that some of his livestock might be stolen, Cook tried to interest some of the chiefs in them by presenting the king with a bull and cow and some goats, to Finau a horse and mare, and to Mariwaji a ram and two ewes. Some one, however, was not satisfied, and a kid and two turkey cocks were stolen, and as thefts had been frequent and very daring, including an attempt to steal one of the anchors off the discovery, which would have been successful had not one of the flukes of the anchor got fixed in one of the chain plates, Cook determined to put his foot down. He seized three canoes, and hearing Finau and some other chiefs were in a house together, he placed a guard over them and informed them they would be detained till the stolen goods were returned. They took the matter coolly and said that everything should be returned. Some of the things being produced, Cook invited his prisoners on board ship to dine and when they came back the kid and the turkey were brought, so the prisoners and canoes were released. At one time a small hostile demonstration was made by the natives, but the landing of a few marines and an order from the king put an end to it. Smart Workmen The following day Cook was invited on shore and found some natives busy erecting two sets of poles, one on each side of the place set apart for the guests. Each set consisted of four places in a square about two feet apart, secured from spreading by cross pieces, and carried up to a height of about thirty feet, the intervening space being filled with yams. On the top of one structure were two baked pigs, and on the other a live one, with a second tied by its legs about halfway up, Cook was particularly struck by the way the men raised these two towers, and says if he had ordered his sailors to do such a thing, they would have wanted carpenters and tools and at least a hundred weight of nails, and would have taken as many days as it did these people hours. When the erections were completed, piles of breadfruit and yams were heaped on either side, and a turtle and some excellent fish were added and then the whole was presented to Cook. A party of officers from both ships went off to an island without leave, and returned two days after without their muskets, ammunition and other articles which had been stolen. They persuaded Omai to make a private complaint to the king, which resulted in the chiefs leaving the neighbourhood. Their disappearance annoyed Cook, and when the affair was explained to him, he severely reprimanded Omai, for speaking on the matter without orders. This put Omai on his mettle, and he managed to persuade Finau to return, and informed the king that no serious consequences should ensue. Matters were then easily smoothed over. Most of the stolen goods, including the missing turkey, were returned, and the king said he ought not to have been held responsible, for if he had known that anyone wished to see the island, he would have sent a chief who would have ensured their safety. An eclipse of the sun was to occur on the 5th of July, and Cook decided to remain so as to secure observations, and meanwhile employed himself in exploring the neighbourhood and studying the customs of the natives. On one occasion, thinking to see an interesting ceremony, he accompanied Polaho, who was going to do state mourning for a son who had been dead some time. The result was disappointing, and the chief impression left with Cook seems to have been that over their clothing of native cloth, those present wore old and rugged mats, those of the king being the raggedest, 
and might have secured his great-grandfather on some such occasion. The 5th of July proved dark and cloudy, with heavy showers of rain, and the observations were unsatisfactory, especially as the clouds came up thickly in the middle of the eclipse, and the sun was seen no more for the rest of the day. This failure was not of great importance, for the longitude had already been satisfactorily ascertained by several very good lunar observations. So as soon as the eclipse was over, everything was sent on board the ships, including the sheep which had been presented to Marawaji. No one had taken any notice of them since they were landed, and Cook felt sure they would be killed by the dogs as soon as the ships left. End of chapter 16, part 1「Number Sixteen, Part Two of the Life of Captain James Cook, the Circumnavigator, by Arthur Kitson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Number Sixteen, Part Two, seventeen seventy six to seventeen seventy seven, Third Voyage. A Native Ceremony. As the wind proved contrary and it was understood that the king's son was to be initiated into the estate of manhood, eating with his father for the first time, Cook determined to remain a few days longer. A party of the officers went over to the island of Moa, where the ceremony was to be held, and found the king in a very dirty enclosure, drinking kava, and as the method of preparing this beverage was uninviting to Europeans, they went for a walk till about ten o'clock, finding large numbers of people assembling in an open space near a large building. They rejoined the king, taking off their hats and untying their hair, that we might appear more decent in the eyes of the natives. The proceedings consisted of marching of men laden with yams, tied on to sticks, of considerable speech making and various performances of which the signification could not be understood, and then the prince made his appearance. He seated himself with a few of his friends on the ground, and some women wound a long piece of cloth around them, and after some more speech-making and mysterious pantomime with sticks representing yams, the proceedings ended for the day. As there were signs that so many white onlookers was not altogether acceptable to the natives, some of the party returned to the ships. But Cook resolved to see it out, and joined the king at supper, and the latter enjoyed some brandy and water so much that Cook says he went to bed quite groggish. After breakfast, Cook paid a visit to the prince and presented him with enough English cloth to make a suit, receiving native cloth in return. After dinner, the people mustered for the remains of the ceremony, and Cook determined to join the principal party, so he seated himself with it, and would not understand when requested to leave. He was then requested to bear his shoulders as a mark of respect, and immediately did so, and was then no further molested. A somewhat similar performance was gone through as the day before, but the significance of which could not be ascertained. And then suddenly all the people turned their backs on King and Prince, who Cook was afterwards informed, had had pieces of roast yam given them to eat. An exhibition of boxing and wrestling was then given, and after a speech or two the proceedings terminated. Cook was informed that in about three months a much greater affair would take place at which ten men would be sacrificed. On the 10th of July, the ship sailed through a very difficult passage, arriving off Middleburg on the 12th, where they were visited by their old friend Taufa. The country appeared flourishing, and they obtained some turnips raised from seed sown at Cook's last visit. An exhibition of boxing was given, 
and was to have been repeated the following night, but unfortunately some of the natives fell upon a sailor and stripped him of his clothes. Cook thereupon seized two canoes and a pig, demanding that the culprit should be given up. A man who had the shirt and trousers was brought, and so the canoes were returned and the pig paid for, and next day the thief was liberated. The remainder of the sailor's clothes were afterwards found, but so much torn as to be worthless. They left the friendly islands on the 17th, after a stay of more than two months, during which time they had been living almost entirely on food they had purchased from the natives, with whom they had been on fairly good terms. The 29th brought them into a very heavy squall, which cost the resolution a couple of stay sails, and her consort a main topmast and main top gallant yard, springing the head of her main mast so badly that the rigging of the jury mast was attended with some danger. But it was at length accomplished, a spare jibboom being furnished for the purpose by the resolution. Otaheite was reached on the 12th of August, and amongst the first visitors on board were Omai's brother-in-law and others who knew him before he went away. They treated him as if he was an Englishman and a stranger, but when he took his brother-in-law to his cabin and gave him some of the valuable red feathers, a change came over them all, and they expressed the greatest interest in him. Cook says Omai would take no advice, but permitted himself to be made the dupe of every designing knave. Of these red feathers, Cook says they were of such value that not more than might be got from a tomtit would purchase a hog of forty or fifty pounds weight. Nails and beads were not looked at, although they had previously been very acceptable. Spanish Ships Two ships from Lima were found to have visited the island twice since Cook's last call and the first time the Spaniards built a house with material they had with them. They left four men in charge, and were away for about ten months. At the second visit their commodore died, and was buried near the house which was left at their departure, and the natives built a shade over it to protect it from the weather. It consisted of two rooms, furnished with table, bed, bench, and a few other trifles, and the timbers were found to have been carefully marked to facilitate erection. Nearby was a cross having the following inscription cut on it, Christus Vincit, Carolus III, Imperat 1774. Cook caused to be cut on the back, Georgius Tertius Rex, Annus, seventeen sixty seven sixty nine seventy three seventy four et seventy eight at the end of their first visit the spaniards took away four natives to lima one died one remained at lima and the other two returned with the ships but cook thinks they were not improved by their experience and had not added to their respectability in the eyes of their countrymen in view of the cold climate to be faced in the near future, Cook was desirous to save his stock of spirits and mustered the crew of the resolution in order to explain the position. He pointed out that the supply of coconuts was abundant and the benefit of the spirits would be appreciated amongst the cold winds and the ice of the north, but left the decision to them. He was gratified to find the crew was willing to accept his suggestion and ordered clerk to put the matter before the crew of the discovery when it was again well received an order was accordingly issued to stop serving grog except on saturday nights when they had full allowance to drink to their female friends in england lest amongst the pretty girls of otaheite they should be wholly forgotten during a state visit paid by the chief of the district, at which Omai attended, dressed in a very strange medley of all he was possessed of, 
Cook was informed that the Spaniards laid claim to the country, and had given instructions that Cook was not to be allowed to land if he returned. However, the chief executed a formal surrender of his province to Cook, and presents were exchanged. The whole ceremony ended with a display of fireworks, which both pleased and astonished the natives. Some of the civilians reported that they had discovered a Roman Catholic chapel in their walks, but on inspection it proved to be what Cook at once suspected, the grave of a chief decorated with different coloured cloths and mats, and a piece of scarlet broadcloth which had to be given by the Spaniards. Red Feathers On the 23rd of August, the two ships arrived in Matavi Bay, where they were well received by Otu, who was gratified by a present of a fine linen suit, a hat with a gold band, some tools, a feather helmet from the friendly islands, and what he seemed to value most, a large bunch of the celebrated red feathers. In return, he sent on board the ships enough food to have lasted both crews for a week, if it had only been possible to keep it good for that length of time. The royal family dined on board the Resolution, and after dinner Cook and Omai called on Opari, taking with them a peacock and a peahen sent to the island by Lord Bessborough, a turkey cock and a hen, a gander and three geese, a drake and four ducks to make a start in stocking the island. A gander was seen, which the natives said had been left by Wallace ten years previously. Several goats and a bull left by the Spaniards were also seen, so Cook landed three cows as company for the last. The horses and sheep were also landed, and Cook remarks that getting rid of all these animals lightened him of a very great burden. The trouble and vexation that attended the bringing of these animals thus far is hardly to be conceived, but the satisfaction I felt in having been so fortunate as to fulfil His Majesty's design in sending such useful animals to two worthy nations sufficiently recompensed me for the many anxious hours I had on their account. Whilst here, the two ships were thoroughly overhauled and everywhere put into as good a state of repair as the appliances available would permit. The stores were found to be in a better state than had been expected, and very little of the bread was damaged. Gardens were laid out and planted with potatoes, melons, pineapples, etc. But Cook was not very sanguine of their success, for he had seen how a vine planted by the Spaniards had been spitefully trampled down, as the natives, tasting the grapes before they were ripe, had concluded it was poisonous. It was carefully pruned into proper shape again, and Omai was instructed to set forth its merits and how it should be cultivated. Towards the end of the month, a man reported that the two Spanish ships had returned and showed a piece of cloth he said he had obtained from them. So Cook, not knowing if England and Spain were on friendly terms, prepared for the worst, and the two ships made ready for defence if necessary. Lieutenant Williamson was dispatched in a boat for news, but could see no ships, nor signs of any having been on the coast since the English left their last port of call. A Human Sacrifice at their last visit, an expedition was being prepared against the revolted island of Imeo, but it did not seem to have been very successful in its object, for there were still disturbances going on between the two nations, and on the 30th of August news came that the Otahitians had been driven up into the hills. A grand meeting was held to discuss matters, and great efforts were made to enlist the services of Cook, but he would not assist in any way, as he did not understand the cause of the quarrel, and he had always found the inhabitants of Imeo friendly towards him. 
having heard that a chief named Tofa had killed a man as a sacrifice to their god, Cook obtained permission to witness the remaining ceremonies as he thought it offered an opportunity to learn something of the religion of this people. He therefore started with Dr. Anderson, Mr. Webber, and the chief Potatau in a boat accompanied by Omai in a canoe for the scene of action. On their arrival, the sailors were instructed to remain in the boat, and the gentlemen were requested to remove their hats as soon as they reached the Morai, where the ceremony was to take place. When they got there, the body of the victim was seen in a small canoe in front of the Morai, and was just in the wash of the sea, in charge of four priests and their attendants, the king and his party some twenty or thirty paces away, and the rest of the spectators a little further still. Two priests came forward to Otu, one placing a young plantain tree in front of him, and the other touched his foot with a bunch of red feathers, and then rejoining the others, who immediately went off to a smaller morai near, and seated themselves facing the ocean, one commencing reciting a long prayer, occasionally sending one of his attendants to place a young plantain on the body, Whilst this recitation was going on, an attendant stood near holding two small bundles, seemingly of cloth, In one, as we afterwards found, was the royal marrow, and the other, if I may be allowed the expression, was the ark of the Yatua, God. This prayer being ended, the priest returned to the beach, and more prayers were said, the plantains being moved one by one from the body and placed in front of the priests. Then the body, wrapped in leaves, was put on the beach, with the feet to the sea, and the priests gathered round, some sitting, some standing, the prayers still going on. The leaves were then stripped off the body, and it was turned sideways on to the sea, and one priest, standing at the feet, repeated another long prayer, in which he was occasionally joined by the others. Each priest at this time held in his hand a bunch of the red feathers. Some hair was now being pulled from the head of the corpse, and an eye was taken out, wrapped in leaves and presented to Otu, who did not touch them, but sent them back with a bunch of feathers. Soon after sending a second bunch, he had asked Cook to put in his pocket for him when starting. At this point a kingfisher made a noise in some trees near, and Otu remarked, That is Atua, evidently looking on it as a good omen. The body was now moved away to the foot of one of the small morais, the two bundles of cloth being placed at the morai at its head, and the tufts of feathers at its feet, the priests surrounding the body and the people gathering in closer. More speeches were made, and a second lock of hair plucked from the head and placed on the morai. Then the red feathers were placed on the cloth bundles, which were carried over to the great morai and laid against a pile of stones, to which the body was also brought, and the attendants proceeded to dig a grave, whilst the priests continued their recitations. The body was then buried, and a dog Torfa had sent over, a very poor one, says Cook, was partially cooked and presented to the priests, who called on Atua to come and see what was prepared for him, at the same time putting it on a small altar, on which were the remains of two dogs and three pigs, which smelt so intolerably that the white men were compelled to move further away than they wished. This ended the ceremony for the day. The King's Marrow Next morning they all returned to the Morai. A pig was sacrificed and placed on the same altar, and about eight o'clock the priests, Otu, and a great number of people assembled. The two bundles were still in the same place as on the previous night, but two drums were now sitting in front of them, 
between which Otu and Cook seated themselves. The priests, placing a plantain tree in front of the king, resumed their praying, each having his bunch of feathers in his hand. They then moved off to a place between the morai and the king and placed the feathers bunch by bunch on the bundles, the prayers still going on. Four pigs were then produced, one immediately killed, and the others put in a sty for future use. The bundle containing the king's marrow was now untied and spread carefully on the ground before the priests. The marrow was about five yards long by fifteen inches broad, composing of red and yellow feathers, chiefly yellow. At one end was a border of eight pieces about the size and shape of horseshoes fringed with black pigeon's feathers. The other end was forked, the ends being of unequal length. The feathers were arranged in two rows and had a very good effect. They were fastened on a piece of native cloth and then sewn to the English pendant, which Wallace left flying when he sailed from Matavai Bay. After the priests had repeated another prayer, the emblem of royalty was carefully folded up and replaced on the morai, and then one end of what Cook called the Ark of Atua was opened, but the visitors were not permitted to see what it contained. The entrails of the pig were then prayed over, and one of the priests stirred them gently with a stick evidently trying to draw a favourable omen from their movements. They were then thrown on the fire. The partly cooked pig was deposited on the altar, and when the bunches of feathers that had been used had been placed in the ark, the ceremony was over. The meanings of all this could not be discovered, but it was found that when a victim was wanted, a chief picked him out and sent his servants to kill him. This was done without any warning to the man who was to suffer, usually by a blow with a stone on the head, and it appeared that at the subsequent ceremony the presence of the king was absolutely indispensable. Chiefs of an enemy's tribe who were killed in battle were buried with some state in the Morais, the common men at the foot. On the way back to the ship, Cook called on Tofa who had supplied the victim. He was anxious to ascertain Cook's opinion of the affair, and was not pleased to learn that Cook thought such a proceeding was more likely to offend the deity than to please him. He then inquired if the English ever practised such ceremonies, and was very angry when he was informed that if the greatest chief in England killed one of his men, he would be hanged and Cook says they left him with as great a contempt for our customs as we could possibly have for theirs. The servants evidently listened to Omai with great interest and a different opinion on the subject than that of their master. They went to inspect the body of a chief who had been embalmed. They were not allowed to examine it very closely, but it was so well done that they were unable to perceive the slightest unpleasant smell, though the man had been dead some months. All chiefs who died a natural death were preserved in this manner, and from time to time were exposed to public view, the intervals between the exposures gradually extending, till at length they were hardly ever seen. The method of preservation was not ascertained, and was probably a secret of the priests. Equestrian Exercise Cook and Clerk astonished the natives by riding the horses that had been brought out. Their progress through the country was always watched with great interest, and Cook thought that this use of the animals impressed the people more than anything else done by the whites. Omai tried his powers on several occasions, but as he was always thrown before he got securely into the saddle, his efforts only produced entertainment for the spectators. It is curious to note that forty years afterwards, the people had so thoroughly lost even the tradition of such use of the horse, 
that Mr. Alice relates how, when one was landed for the use of Pomari, the natives assisted to get it ashore, but when once landed they ran away and hid in fear of the man-carrying pig. About this time, Cook suffered from a bad attack of rheumatism in the legs, and was successfully treated by Otu's mother, three sisters, and eight other women. The process he underwent, called Romi, consisted of squeezing and kneading from head to foot, more especially about the parts affected. Cook says he was glad to escape from their ministrations after about a quarter of an hour, but he felt relief, and after submitting to four operations of the kind, he was completely cured. Otu was very desirous to send a present of a canoe to King George, and Cook was very willing to take it, but when he found it was a large double canoe, he was obliged to decline from want of space. As the desire to send it was quite spontaneous on Otu's part, and as the canoe was a very fine specimen of native work, the refusal was given with great regret. In a journal published by Newbury, the anonymous writer says that two officers fought a duel whilst the ships were at Otaheite. He does not give the cause, but says three shots were exchanged, resulting in one hat being spoiled, and then the antagonists shook hands and were better friends afterwards. The story is not confirmed by any of the other journals. On the 29th of September, after giving Otu a short run out to see him back, the two ships sailed for the north side of Imeo. Arriving the next day, and were greeted by a chief, Mahini, who was bald-headed. Of this defect he seemed much ashamed, and always appeared with his head covered with a sort of turban. Cook thinks perhaps this shame rose from the fact that natives caught stealing on the ships were often punished by having their heads shaved, and adds that one or two of the gentlemen whose heads were not overburdened with hair lay under violent suspicions of being Tito's, thieves. One of the few remaining goats was stolen, but after threats of serious reprisals was given up, together with the thief, who was eventually discharged with a caution. But on a second one disappearing and not being found after careful search, Cook felt that he must make an example or nothing would be safe so he ordered one or two houses and canoes to be destroyed, and sent word to Mahini that he would not leave a canoe on the island if the goat was not returned. The goat was recovered, and the next day the people were as friendly as if nothing had occurred. Cook was particularly annoyed, for he had sent a present of red feathers to Otu, and requested him to send in return a couple of goats to Imeo. Oh my settled. On the 11th of October, the ship sailed for Huihini, and when they arrived, Cook was so ill he had to be landed from the ship, but he makes no mention of it in his journal. He thought this island would be more suitable for Omai than Otaheite, and as Omai was agreeable, a piece of ground was obtained from the chief, and a small house erected and a garden laid out and planted. The interest of the different chiefs of the neighbourhood was sought on Omai's behalf, and as it was seen that some of the natives were inclined to take advantage of his good nature, Cook let it be understood that if he should return and find Omai in an unsatisfactory condition, someone would feel the weight of his displeasure. Then the most serious thing that can be brought against Cook's treatment of the natives occurred. In extenuation, it must be remembered that he admits that he was inclined to be hot-tempered, though it did not last. He had been constantly irritated by repeated losses, and he was at the time really seriously ill, and also, when all was over, he sincerely regretted he had taken such strong measures. Mr. Bailey's sextant was stolen from the observatory, Cook at once demanded from the chiefs that it should be returned, but they paid no attention. 
The thief, however, was pointed out and seized and taken on board ship. The sextant was recovered, but Cook says, finding the thief to be a hardened scoundrel, I punished him with greater severity than I have ever done any one before, and then dismissed him. He is said to have had his head shaved and his ears cut off, but Gilbert, midshipman on the discovery, says this was not done till he had been rearrested for damaging Omai's garden, trying to set fire to the house, and threatening to kill Omai as soon as the ships left. Cook had intended to remove him from the island, but being in irons, he stole the keys from his sleeping guard and made his escape. Omai found that many of the articles which were practically useless to him would be appreciated on the ships, so he very wisely changed them for hatchets and other useful articles. A notice of the visit with the names of the ships was cut on the end of Omai's house, and after firing a salute of five guns, the ships sailed on the 2nd of November. Omai accompanied them for a short way, and Mr. King says that when he parted from Cook, he completely broke down and cried all the way ashore. Cook speaks well of him, saying he seldom had to find fault with him, that he had many good qualities, but like the rest of his race, he lacked powers of observation, application and perseverance. Desertions On the third, they were off to Elitia, and as they were able to run in close to the shore, a staging was erected, and the ballast ports were open so as to give the rats, which had become very troublesome, a chance of going ashore. One of the marines also took the opportunity to desert, taking his musket with him, but after a little trouble was arrested, and having previously borne a very good character, he was let off with a short imprisonment. A second desertion occurred from the discovery, Mr. Muat, midshipman, and a seaman getting away. Cook says the affair gave him more trouble than both men were worth, but he insisted on getting them back to prevent others following their example, and to save the son of a brother officer from being lost to the world. They were found to have gone off in a canoe to another island, and Cook ordered Clerk to detain the chief, his son, daughter and son-in-law, on the discovery, where they had gone to dine, and to inform them they would be kept as hostages till the runaways were returned. Three days afterwards the deserters were brought back, and the hostages were at once released. It was afterwards found out that there had been a plot to seize Cook in retaliation, when he went for his usual bath in the evening, but as it happened, he was so much worried that he put it off and so escaped. Burney notes that Cook could not swim. Before leaving, they received a message from Omai, saying he was all right, but asking for another goat as one of his was dead. Clerk was able to oblige him with two kids, one of each sex. End of chapter 16 Part 2Chapter number 17 of The Life of Captain James Cook, the Circumnavigator, by Arthur Kitson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter number 17, 1777 to 1779, Third Voyage Continued. In case of separation, Clerk was ordered to cruise for five days near where his consort had been last seen, and then to stare for New Albion, so called by Sir Francis Drake, endeavouring to fall in with it about latitude 45 degrees north, and there cruise for ten days. Then, if his consort was not picked up, to proceed north to the first suitable port and recruit his men, keeping a good lookout for his companion. Then he was to sail on the 1st of April, to 56 degrees north, and again cruise about 15 leagues from the coast till the 10th of May, 
when he was to proceed north and endeavour to find a passage to the Atlantic, according to the Admiralty instructions already in his hands. If unsuccessful, he was to winter in some suitable port of Kamchatska, leaving word with the Commandant of St. Peter and St. Paul Harbour, where he was to be found, and to be at the last named place not later than the 10th of May of the following year. Then, if he had no news of the resolution, he was to follow out the Admiralty instructions to the best of his ability. The two ships left for Bolabola on the 7th of December to get an anchor left by de Bougainville in order to make hatchets for exchange. As the demand had been so great, their stock was running short. They had no difficulty in purchasing it, and it was good enough for their purpose, though not so heavy as they expected. They crossed the line on the 23rd in longitude 203 degrees, 15 minutes east, without having seen land since leaving Bola Bola. Two days after, they picked up a low island and managed to get some turtle, and also a rather unsatisfactory observation of an eclipse of the sun the clouds interfering with the view of the commencement. Their position had been settled by other observations, so the ill-luck was unimportant. About 300 turtle were obtained, averaging from 90 to 100 pounds each, and as much fish as they could consume during their stay was caught. Coconuts, yams and melons were planted, and the island received the name of Christmas Island. Sandwich Islands Leaving on the 2nd of January, they did not sight land till the Sandwich Islands were reached, in latitude 21 degrees 12 minutes 30 seconds north. At the second one seen, called Atoy by the natives, they were quickly surrounded by canoes, the occupants, very like the Otahitians in appearance and language, were armed with stones which they threw overboard as soon as they found they were not likely to be wanted, and though none could be persuaded to come on board the ships, they freely parted with fish for anything they could get in exchange. As the ships sailed on, more canoes came out bringing further supplies, and Cook rejoiced at arriving at a land of plenty for his stock of turtle was just finished, and he was anxious to save his sea stores. At length some were tempted on board, and were greatly astonished at what they saw, but their wonder did not last long, and stealing soon broke out as usual. When they came to an anchor, Cook landed and found a favourable place for watering, so a party was set to work the next day, and found no difficulty in getting assistance from the islanders, whilst at the same time a brisk trade was carried on in pigs and potatoes. Cook says, No people could trade with more honesty than these people, never once attempting to cheat us, either ashore or alongside the ship. They seem to have dropped their thieving very quickly. At night a nasty sea got up, and as Cook did not like the position of his ship, he weighed to run a little further out, but the wind suddenly dropping around to the east, he had to set all sail to clear the shore. For a day or two, no very satisfactory anchorage could be found, and the weather was rather unsettled. So, making one of the chiefs a present of an English sow and boar, and a male and two female goats, the ship bore away to the northwards. According to Baron von Humboldt, these islands were discovered by a Spaniard, Gaetano, sailing from Manila to Acapulco in 1542, and it was one of the few discoveries made by the Spaniards during this passage, for they were strictly forbidden to deviate from the track laid down on their charts. The name La Mesa, the table, down on the chart Cook had with him, describes the island, says Burney, but the longitude is several degrees out. 
it is undoubtedly a fact that Europeans had been at the islands previously to Cook's visit, for at least two pieces of iron were found, one being a portion of a broadsword and the other a piece of hoop iron. New Albion On the 7th of March, New Albion was sighted at a distance of 10 or 12 leagues, and the position of the ship at noon was 44 degrees, 33 minutes north, 236 degrees, 30 minutes east. Cook's orders were to make the coast about 45 degrees north, so they may be said to have been carried out with fair exactness. Cook says that on the charts he had, a large entrance or strait was represented, and in the account of Martin Diagula's voyage in 1603, mention is made of a large river near where he struck the coast but he did not see any signs of either proceeding up the coast the progress was very slow as the weather was very stormy on the twenty second of march they passed the position of the strait of juan de Fouque, but again no sign of its existence was seen on the twenty ninth the style of the coast changed and high snowy mountains with well-wooded valleys running down to the sea came into view, and at length Hope Bay opened out. Here they came in contact with the first natives they had seen, who put off in their canoes to the ships, showing signs neither of fear nor distrust. At first they appeared mild and inoffensive, and would trade anything they had with them, but when they got used to the ships, it turned out that they were adepts at thieving. No piece of iron, brass or copper was safe. Fish hooks were cut from the lines and boats were stripped of their fittings. They sold bladders of oil for the lamps, and it was found that they were often partly filled with water. But this was winked at in order to get on a thoroughly friendly footing. This being a favourable opportunity to put the two vessels in order, and to give the crews a spell of rest ashore. A good anchorage was sought out, and the observatory set up. On the 4th of April, whilst wood and water were being got, the natives, who had given no trouble beyond their stealing, were observed to be arming, and precautions were taken. But the Indians explained that their preparations were made against some of their own countrymen who were on their way to fight them. After a time, some canoes made their appearance, and a deputation going out to meet them, a discussion took place, and some sort of agreement was made between the two parties, but the newcomers were not allowed to approach the ships, nor to join in the trading. The stay here was longer than was intended, for the resolutions fore and mizzen masts were found to be very defective and her rigging had got into a very bad state. The foremast was repaired, and the mizzen replaced with a new stick, and when a great deal of work had been done, this proved faulty, and a second one had to be cut. New standing rigging was fitted to the mainmast, and a set made from the best of the old for the foremast. When the heaviest part of this work was completed, Cook visited the country about King George's Sound and was courteously received at a village by the natives, to most of whom he was known. Here he found the woman employed making dresses out of bark in much the same way as that employed by the New Zealanders. Sending some sailors to cut grass for the sheep and goats he had left, the natives made a claim which was at once satisfied but when the men were ordered to go on cutting, fresh claimants sprung up, till Cook says he thought each blade of grass had a separate owner. When at last the natives found that they could get no more, the cutting was allowed to go on without the slightest further objection. Punch and the Devil The people are described as being short, with broad flat faces, high cheekbones, swarthy complexions, and no pretensions to good looks. Bernie says that it was only after much cleaning that their skins were found to be like our people in England. 
Cook says they were docile, courteous and good-natured, but liable to fits of passion. I have often seen a man rave and scold for more than half an hour without anyone taking the least notice of it, nor could anyone of us tell who it was he was abusing. Burney describes their language as harsh, and when in a warm discussion apparently insufficient, and then they had to eck it out with such nods and jumps as reminded one of Punch and the Devil. Their clothing was chiefly made of skins, and a kind of cloth made from fibre or wool and hair, or a mixture of both. In these clothes and a coarse mat and straw hat, they would sit in their canoes in the heaviest rain as unconcernedly as if they were in perfect shelter. Their houses of logs and boards made by splitting large trees were some as much as 150 feet long by 20 to 30 feet wide and 6 or 8 feet high. They were divided into two compartments, each apparently the property of one family. The roof was of loose planks, which they moved about so as to let the light fall where it was wanted. Cook judged these were only summer residences and that they had better houses inland. The furniture consisted of a few boxes, some wooden vessels for their food and a few mat bags. Their cooking was fairly good but excessively dirty and their persons and houses filthy as hog styes. They often had two wooden figures in their houses resembling human figures, of which they spoke mysteriously, but as they could have been purchased in every case for a small quantity of old iron or brass, they could not have been much venerated. Their arms were bows and arrows, slings, spears and a small club of wood or stone, something like the New Zealander patu and a stone tomahawk the handle fashioned like a human head, the stone cutting part being a large tongue, and they were decorated with human hair. The defensive armour was a double cloak of hide, usually moose, serviceable against arrows or spears, but they were greatly surprised to see a bullet fired through a cloak folded four times. The only vegetables obtained were a few nettles and wild garlic, but Burney says that at the back of the village was a plantation of cherry trees, gooseberries and currants, raspberries and strawberries, but unluckily for us none of them were in season. On the 20th of April, a man who had been allowed to go into Cook's cabin made off with his watch and got away from the ship. Fortunately, his canoe was seen alongside the Discovery, and notice being given, a search was made, and the watch found in a box unharmed. Such a loss would have been serious. Two old-fashioned silver tablespoons, supposed to be Spanish, and a pewter wash basin were purchased from the Indians. Resolution Leaks On the 26th of April, a start was made, and before leaving, an Indian, who had specially attached himself to Cook, gave him a valuable beaver skin and was so pleased with the return present he received that he insisted on Cook taking from him a beaver cloak upon which he had always set great store. In return, he was made as happy as a prince by a gift of a new broadsword with a brass hilt. The next day, when well clear of the land, a perfect hurricane arose, and the ship lay to, heading to the southeast. The resolution sprang a leak, and the water could be seen and heard rushing in, but after some little anxiety, one pump was found to be sufficient to keep the upper hand. The gale lasted two days, but on the second they were able to get an observation which gave the position of the ship as 50 degrees 1 minute north, 229 degrees 26 minutes east, about opposite to where the Straits of De Fonte were marked on his chart. They were now able to run along the coast and see and name the most salient points. 
but time was too valuable to make any halts by the way. The land appeared to be of considerable height, the hills covered with snow, but near the sea well wooded. Mount St. Elias was sighted on the 4th of May, at a distance of 40 leagues, and on the 6th they arrived in the bay in which Bering had anchored, so his name was given to it on the chart. Here the land trended away to the west, the wind was westerly and light, and consequently their progress was very slow. Landing on an island, to try to get a view of the other side from the top of a hill, it was found so steep and thickly wooded that he had to give up the attempt. He therefore left a bottle containing some coins given him by his friend, Dr. K, and named the island after him. Here they found a currant and strawberry plants, but the season was too early for fruit. Near Cape Hinchinbrook, Gore went off to an island to shoot, but seeing two large canoes containing about twenty Indians, he thought it wiser to return to the ship. He was followed up, but none of the natives would come on board, and after a time intimating they would return next day, retired. Two men in small canoes did return during the night, but finding that everyone on board was not asleep, beat a hurried retreat. The next day the ships got into a better position, and more Indians turned up, with whom they had little difficulty in entering into trading relations. But as they desired pieces of iron about ten inches long by three wide, and it was rather a scarce article on board, very little, chiefly skins, was purchased. At first only one man came on board, and as soon as he saw only two or three people on the discovery, he went to the resolution and brought over some of his friends, who rushed the deck with their knives drawn. However, the crew quickly ran up with their cutlasses ready, so the natives retired, remarking that the white men's knives were longer than theirs. At the resolution they broke every glass scuttle they could reach with their paddles, says Burney. Cook points out that they must have been quite ignorant of the use of firearms and concludes by saying, however, after all these tricks, we had the good fortune to leave them as ignorant as we found them, for they neither heard nor saw a musket fired unless at birds. The leak on the resolution was attended to, and in places the oakum corking was found to have disappeared completely. One writer says it was caused by rats, and that the ship was saved by rubbish having choked up the leak. Two sets of teeth. Bad weather detaining them, Cook had the opportunity of studying the inhabitants. He had with him a description of the Eskimo by Krantz, and found these men to be very similar in appearance, dress and appliances. They also had the bottom lip slit horizontally, giving them the appearance of having two mouths. In these slits, pieces of bone were fixed to which were tied other pieces, forming a great impediment to their speech, and in some cases giving the idea that the wearer had two sets of teeth. Some also had pieces of bone, cord or beads run through the cartilage of the nose and all had their faces plentifully smeared with black and red paint. After examining an inlet, which received the name of Sandwich Sound, they got away, staring to the southwest past Cape Elizabeth, sighted on that princess's birthday, which they hoped would prove the western extremity of the coast, but on getting round, land was reported further on to the west-southwest, and a gale sprang up, forcing them off their course. In two days they worked back again, discovering more land behind what they had already seen. This cook believed to be Cape St. Hermogenes, mentioned by Bering, but his chart was so inaccurate he could not positively identify it, or any other place mentioned on it. Cape Douglas, after the Dean of Windsor, was named 
and placed at 58 degrees 56 minutes north, 206 degrees 10 minutes east. And the next day, a high point in a range was called Mount St. Augustine, after the saint whose day it happened to be. They then worked into an estuary formed by the rivers, one being afterwards named Cook's River, by orders of Lord Sandwich, in order to satisfy some of the officers who thought there might be a possible communication with Hudson's Bay. A good supply of very fine salmon was obtained from natives in the neighbourhood, and Cook formed the opinion that a paying fur trade might be opened up as the skins offered were of considerable value. Working slowly up the coast, they passed through the islands of Quelpart on the 18th, when the discovery signalled to speak, a boat was sent and returned with a small box curiously tied up with neatly made twine. It had been delivered on board by an Indian, who first attracted attention by displaying a pair of old plush breeches and a black cloth waistcoat, and when he came on board, took off his cap and bowed like a European. The box was found to contain a paper written in Russian, but unfortunately the only things that could be understood were the two dates, 1776 and 1778. It was supposed to have been written by a Russian trader and given to the Indian to place it on board the first ship he met with. On the 20th, in 54 degrees 18 minutes north, 195 degrees 45 minutes east, a volcano throwing out dense smoke was observed, and in the afternoon they received a visit from a man who had evidently been in contact with Europeans, for he was wearing green cloth breeches and a stuff jacket. He took off his cap and bowed as the visitor to the discovery had done, but unfortunately they were unable to understand his language. On the 26th of June they had a narrow escape during a thick fog, when it was not possible to see anything a hundred yards away. Breakers were heard, so the anchors were let go and fortunately held. An hour or so after the fog lifted and they found themselves about three quarters of a mile from a rocky island having passed between two elevated rocks, a place through which, Cook says, I should have ventured on a clear day, for all that they found themselves in such an anchoring place that I could not have chosen better. Anderson dies. On the 27th of June, they were off the island of Onalashka and came across a party of natives who were towing two whales they had killed. They were somewhat shy, but had evidently seen ships before, and were more polite than those previously met with. One was upset from his canoe, and Cook took him down into the cabin and provided him with dry clothes. He dressed himself with as much ease as I could have done. His clothes were of bird skins, the feathers inside, and patched in places with silk and overall he wore a sort of shirt of whale's intestine, which secured round the edge of the hole in which he sat in his canoe, rendering him practically waterproof. Whilst in this neighbourhood, they received a second letter in Russian, but having no one on board who could translate, it was returned with some presents to the bearer, who retired bowing his thanks. After some detention from fogs and adverse winds, they got away once more and pushed slowly northwards. On the 3rd of August, Mr. Anderson, the surgeon, who had been ill for some months, died, and Cook, having named an island, sighted soon after his death, Anderson's Island, to perpetuate the memory of the deceased for whom I had a very great regard, appointed Mr. Law to the resolution and Mr. Samwell to the discovery as surgeons. On the 9th of August, Cape Prince of Wales, 65 degrees 46 minutes north, 191 degrees 45 minutes east, was sighted. 
and they believed it to be the most westerly point of North America. They landed on what, from Haydinger's chart, was the eastern end of the island of Alaska, but it soon afterwards was found to have been the eastern extremity of Asia. This chart, says Burney, was found not only to be incorrect but almost unintelligible. The country was very desolate, neither tree nor shrub to be seen, and the inhabitants seemed afraid of their visitors, though not absolutely unfriendly. They were taller and stouter than those on the American side, and their clothing very superior. The ships fell in with the ice blink on the 17th, in 70 degrees 33 minutes north, 197 degrees 41 minutes east, rather earlier than had been expected, and soon afterwards with the ice itself in the shape of a large field extending as far as the eye could reach from west to east. Here they got a fresh supply of meat in the shape of seahorse, of which animal they killed a good many. The flesh was fishy and indifferent eating, but Cook says anything was preferable to salt meat. They still slowly but steadily pushed north along the American shore, but being hampered by fog and ice, they crossed over to the west side with no better fortune, for on the 26th they found themselves embayed in the field with large quantities of heavy, loose ice along the edges. Having sighted Cape North on the 29th of August, Cook decided the season was too far advanced, and that it would be better to proceed to winter quarters, and accordingly ran down the Asiatic coast in search of wood and water, of which he stood in need, but was disappointed, and making over to the other side was fortunate to find a considerable quantity of driftwood, which served his purpose. Before leaving the Straits, Cook remarks, In justice to Bering's memory, I must say he delineated this coast very well, and fixed the latitude and longitude of the points better than could be expected from the methods he had to go by. Salmon Pie Anchoring in Norton Sound, Cook sent away the boats to explore, and set to work to determine between the correctness of the chart drawn by Stocklin and his own observations, and after a series of no less than 77 sets of observations, he was able to show that Stockland was wrong. It was at this place that he decided to winter in the Sandwich Islands, as a port in Kamchatska would oblige his crews to remain idle for nearly six months before further exploration to the north could be undertaken. The course was now set for Samgenuda Harbour, but they did not arrive there till the 3rd of October, having met with very heavy weather in which the resolution again began to leak badly. On the 8th of September, an Indian brought a singular present in the form of a pie made like a loaf, containing some highly seasoned salmon, accompanied by a letter in Russian. In return, Corporal Ledyard of the Marines, an intelligent man, was sent with a few bottles of rum, wine and porter, to obtain further information, and with orders, if he met with any Russians, he was to make them understand that we were English, friends and allies. On the 10th, Ledyard returned, bringing three Russian sailors, but as there was no interpreter, there was difficulty in understanding anything thoroughly. One of the newcomers was understood to say he had been out with Bering, but Cook thought he was too young, they appeared to have a great respect for that officer, and Ledyard said he had seen a sloop which he understood was his ship. They stayed on the resolution all night, and promised to return with a chart of the islands that lay between that place and Kamchatska. It was understood that there were several settlements in the immediate neighbourhood, employing altogether about 400 Russians. Letters to London on the 14th, Cook and Weber were at an Indian village a short distance from the ships, 
when they saw a canoe arrive containing three men and accompanied by some twenty or thirty single canoes. A tent was rigged up for one of the first three. A Russian named Ismailov, the chief trader of the district, whilst the others made shelters of their canoes and grass, and so all were independent of the Indians. Ismailov invited Cook to join him at his meal, which consisted of dried salmon and berries, and some sort of conversation was carried on by means of signs and figures. Ismailov proved to be well acquainted with the geography of the district and pointed out several errors in the modern maps. He said he had been with Lieutenant Lindo's expedition as far north as Chutotskoy Nos and saw Clerk's Island, but when he could or would not say what else they had done during the two years the expedition was out, Cook began to have doubts. He also said the Russians had several times tried to gain a footing on the American shore, but the Indians had driven them off with the loss of two or three of their leaders. He also spoke of a sledge expedition in 1773 to three islands opposite the Colima River, which Cook thought might be the one mentioned by Muller. He related that he had sailed in 1771 from a Russian settlement called Bolshevsky in the Kurel Islands to Japan, but the ship was ordered away because they were Christians, so they went to Canton and sailed on a French ship to France, and from thence he went to Petersburg and was then sent out again. He was quite clear as to his dates and put them on paper, but as he was perfectly ignorant of any French, not even the names of the commonest articles, though he had been such a long time amongst French people, Cook was again inclined to be sceptical. He stayed all night dining with Clerk and returned again on the 19th with charts, which he permitted to be copied and some manuscripts. One chart showed the Asiatic coast as far as 41 degrees north, with the Kuril Islands in Kamchatka, and the second, the more interesting to the English, showed the discoveries made by the Russians to the east of Kamchatka, exclusive of the voyages of Bering and Cherikov. Cook found the longitudes and places were very different from those on the Russian maps, and was afraid the mistake might be carried through, but the latitudes were fairly correct. As far as he could ascertain, the instruments used for the survey had been a theodolite. Before leaving, Ismailov gave Cook letters for the governor of Kamchatka and the commandant of Petropolovsk, and Cook, finding he was tolerably well versed in astronomy, gave him a Hadley's octant and though it was the first one he had seen, he soon made himself acquainted with its uses. A letter to the English Admiralty was also entrusted to him to be forwarded via Petersburg as opportunity might offer. This letter and a chart of the northern coasts was delivered in London the following year. On the 26th of October, the two ships got away, and in case of separation, Clerk was given his rendezvous, first the Sandwich Islands, and the second Petropolovsk in the middle of May. On the 28th, the discovery met with a nasty accident during a gale. The fore and main tacks carried away, killing one man and seriously injuring the boatswain and two others. On the 25th of November, the islands were sighted, and the customary orders as to the officers appointed to trade with the natives were issued, and no curiosities were to be purchased before the ships had received satisfactory supplies. They first called in at Maui, where the natives soon came out and appeared friendly, and traded with less suspicion than any of the South Sea Islanders they had met with before. Having procured a quantity of sugar cane, Cook ordered it to be used in brewing, as he found a strong decoction of the juice produced a wholesome and palatable bear, and would enable him to save the spirits for colder climates. 
However, the crews would have none of it, so Cook and his officers made use of it whenever cane was procurable, and gave himself no trouble either to oblige or persuade them to drink it, knowing there was no danger of scurvy so long as we had plenty of other vegetables, but that I might not be disappointed in my views, I gave orders that no grog should be served in either ship. He then goes on to say, Every innovation, whatever, though ever so much to their advantage, is sure to meet with the highest disapprobation from seamen. Portable soup and sauerkraut were at first both condemned by them as stuff not fit for human beings to eat. Few men have introduced into their ships more novelties in the way of victuals and drink than I have done. Indeed, few men have had the same opportunity or been driven to the same necessity. It has, however, in a great measure, been owing to such little innovations that I have always kept my people, generally speaking, free from that dreadful distemper, the scurvy. This extract shows how bitterly Cook felt the stupid ingratitude of his men for the constant care he took of them, and is one of the very few passages in his journals in which he speaks in their disfavour. This, curiously, was erased by some unknown hand. King asserts it must have been done by Gore, as he is certain it was not by either Cook nor Clerk, who took command after Cook's death. Faulty sails. In trying to weather the south-east end of Maui in heavy weather, the leech ropes of the main topsail and two topgallant sails gave way, and the sails were blown to pieces. Cook says neither the cordage, canvas, nor indeed hardly any other stores used in the navy are equal in quality to those in general use in the merchant service and he relates how such failures have constantly resulted in infinite trouble, vexation and loss. He illustrates his complaint by the fact that rigging, blocks and sails that were purchased with his ship, although they had been fourteen months in use, wore longer than any of the things of the same kind put on board new from the king's stores. On the 24th of December, they succeeded in getting to windward of the island, but the signal to the discovery to tack having been omitted, she stood on, and it was some days before she rejoined the company. January 1779 was ushered in with heavy rain, but clearing away before noon, they were able to approach to about five miles from the shore, where they lay to and traded with the natives. The next three days were spent working slowly down the coast and keeping a good lookout for their consort, occasionally stopping to do a little trading with the islanders, some of whom came as much as fifteen miles out to them. The chief article of commerce was salt, which was of very good quality. On the 5th of January, the southern point of Owyhee was rounded, and they lay off a large village where they were quickly surrounded by canoes laden with hogs and women. The latter are not held up as patterns of all the virtues. Vegetables seemed to be scarce, and Cook concluded that either the land could not produce him, or the crops had been destroyed by volcanic action, very recent traces of which were to be seen. Wednesday the 6th of January. The next morning the people visited us again bringing with them the same articles as before. Being near the shore, I sent Mr. Bly, the master, in a boat to sound the coast, with orders to land and look for fresh water. On his return, he reported that two cable lengths from the shore he had no soundings with a 160 fathoms of line, that when he landed he found no fresh water, but rainwater lying in holes in the rocks and that brackish with the spray of the sea, and that the surface of the country was wholly composed of large slags and ashes, here and there partly covered with plants. Between ten and eleven o'clock we saw the discovery coming round the south point of the island, and at one p.m. she joined us, when Captain Clerk came on board 
and informed me that he had cruised four or five days where we were separated, and then plied round the last part of the island, but meeting with unfavourable winds was carried some distance from the coast. He had one of the islanders on board all the time. It was his own choice, nor did not leave them the first opportunity that offered. This was the last entry made by Cook in the journal he was preparing for publication, and is a fair sample of the manner in which the entire journal was written, and certainly does not justify the sneers that have been uttered about bad grammar and spelling, the double negative notwithstanding. In handwriting, spelling and grammar, he can compare well with his press, either in the navy or in civil life and many of the examples of bad spelling given have been abbreviations common in the Navy, which his critics did not understand. Karakakoa Bay On the 17th of January, they anchored in Karakakoa Bay, where large numbers of canoes laden with provisions for sale came out. Cook estimates that at one time there were no less than a thousand round the ship, their occupants entirely unarmed. They soon proved to be adepts at thieving. One man stole the rudder of a boat, so Cook ordered a shot or two to be fired over the escaping thief, but as it was not intended that any of the shots should take effect, the Indians seemed rather more surprised than frightened, and the man got away. The lids of the resolution's coppers were stolen, and the discovery had her rigging much cut about for the sake of the iron. The decks were so crowded with natives that Burney says it kept a quarter of the crew hard at work to make room for the working of the ship. An insecure position. The last entry made by Cook in his ship's journal, and probably the last words he ever wrote, runs as follows. Sunday, 17. Fine pleasant weather and variable faint breezes of wind. In the evening, Mr. Bly returned and reported that he had found a bay in which was good anchorage and fresh water, tolerable easy to come at. Into this bay I resolved to go to refit the ships and take in water. As the night approached, the Indians retired to the shore. A good many, however, desired to sleep on board, Curiosity was not their only motive, at least not with some of them, for the next morning several things were missing, which determined me not to entertain so many another night. At 11am, anchored in the bay, which is called by the natives, a blank filled in by another hand, Karakakoa, in 13 fathoms of water over a sandy bottom, and a quarter of a mile from the north-east shore. In this situation, the south point of the bay bore south quarter west, and the north point west quarter south, moored with the stream anchor to the northward, unbent the sails and struck yards and topmasts. The ships very much crowded with Indians and surrounded by a multitude of canoes. I have nowhere in the sea seen such a number of people assembled at one place. Besides those in the canoes, all the shore of the bay was covered with people, and hundreds were swimming about the ships like shoals of fish. We should have found it difficult to keep them in order, had not a chief or servant of Teriyobu's named Paria, now and then, shown his authority by turning or rather driving them all out of the ship. Among our numerous visitors was a man named Toaha, who we soon found belonged to the church. He introduced himself with much ceremony, in the course of which he presented me with a small pig, two coconuts and a piece of red cloth, which he wrapped around me. In this manner, all or most of the chiefs introduced themselves. But this man went further. He brought with him a large hog and a quantity of fruits and roots, all of which he included in the present. In the afternoon I went ashore to view the place accompanied by Toaha, Paria, Mr. King and others. As soon as we landed, Toaha took me by the hand and conducted me to a large morai. 
the other gentlemen with Paria, and four or five more of the natives followed. Mr. King describes this moray as being about 40 yards long by 20 broad, and about 14 feet high, the top flat, well paved and surrounded by a wooden railing. An old building stood in the centre, from which a stone wall ran to the fence dividing the top into two parts. On the landward side were five poles upwards of twenty feet high, supporting an irregular kind of scaffold, and on the seaside half were two small houses with a covered communication between them. On their arrival, Cook was presented with two ugly images wrapped with red cloth, and a sort of hymn was sung. Then they were marched to the scaffolding, where was a table in which lay fruits and vegetables, surmounted by a very much decomposed pig, and in a semicircle round one end of this table were twelve images. Placing Cook near the scaffolding, Koa, as king, and others, called Tuaha, took up the pig, and holding it towards him, made a long speech. Then, dropping the offensive porker, he made signs that the two were to climb on to the uncertain scaffolding. This being done, a procession came forward, bearing a live hog and a piece of red cloth. This last article was handed up to Koa, who proceeded to wrap it around Cook, who was clinging to his elevated but not very safe position. The pig was then offered to Cook and a long address chanted, the two principal performers then descended and returned to the table. Koa snapped his fingers at the figures and making what appeared to be sarcastic remarks till he came to the centre one when he prostrated himself and kissed it, requesting Cook to do the same. The party then proceeded to the other part of the morai, and Cook was seated between two images with his arms stretched out, one upheld by Koa and the other by king. A cooked pig and other food was then presented with much ceremony, the meat cut up and carver prepared, whilst Koa's assistants chewed some coconut, wrapped it in a cloth, and then rubbed it over Cook's face, head and shoulders and arms. Koa and Paria then pulled pieces of the pig and put them into the mouths of the two officers. King says that Paria was a particularly cleanly person, so he did not so much mind this feeding. But Cook, remembering how Koa had handled the putrid hog, was unable to swallow a mouthful, and his reluctance, as may be supposed, was not diminished when the old man, according to his own mode of civility, had chewed it for him. Cook then put an end to further proceedings by distributing some presents to the attendants and returning to the ship. Though the meaning of this ceremony could only be a matter of conjecture, it was very evident that it was intended as a mark of high respect to the person of Captain Cook. The title of Orono given to him, and often quoted as evidence that he had permitted himself to be looked upon as a god by the natives, was also given to one, if not more, of their own chiefs. And Burney says that the marks of honour conferred on him were exactly the same as those conferred on any one of their own superior chieftains. The grotesque description given by some of the missionary writers of the whole population crawling after him on hands and knees as a mark of adoration is utterly untrue. For Mr. King who was ashore almost the whole time of the ship's stay, and was continually with Cook, distinctly says, The crowd which had collected on the shore retired at our approach, and not a person was to be seen except a few lying prostrate on the ground near the huts of the adjoining village. None of those who were on the voyage and have left any record behind them suggest that Cook was treated in any respect otherwise than as a great chief and a man. A small potato field was placed under Tabu, near the Morai, for the purpose of the observatory, and a camp under the command of King was established there. 
his camp was daily supplied with meat and vegetables even more than could be consumed and several canoe loads were sent off to the ships after inquiry it was found that the whole expense of this food was borne by koa and no return whatever was demanded a royal visit a tabu was placed on the whole of the bay on the twenty fourth and trading came to a complete standstill the reason given being the coming of the king teriobu he arrived the next day and commerce at once revived he paid a private visit with his wife and children to the resolution remaining on board some time and proved to be the same chief they had seen at the island of maui the next day he accompanied by several important chiefs all dressed in rich feather cloaks and armed with long spears and daggers paid a state visit koa was also present in a canoe with other priests and two large basket-work idols whose distorted faces were adorned with pearl-shell eyes and dog's teeth he was attended by two other canoes one filled with pigs and vegetables and these paddled around the ships the priests singing in a most solemn fashion and returned to the shore cook followed king turned out the guard and saluted teriobu and then conducted himself to the tent where after seating himself for a few moments he took off his helmet and cloak and placed them on cook at the same time ordering five or six more of great value to be placed at his feet hogs breadfruit etc were then brought in cook and teriobu exchanged names as a peculiar mark of friendship and the ceremony ended by the presentation of the two boatloads of provisions by a deputation of priests one of those present was a nephew of the king called by the english maiha maiha afterwards known to the world as kamiha miha the first as many of the chiefs as the resolution's pinnace would hold were taken off with the king to the ship and the latter was duly invested with a white linen shirt and cook's own sword during the whole of this performance no canoes excepting those actually engaged were to be seen in the bay and all the natives remained lying on the ground or in their houses clerk who had been too ill to share in these ceremonies landed for the first time on the twenty eighth and though quite unexpected he received a very handsome present of food and teriobu paid the discovery a state call taking with him presents similar to those given to cook in the afternoon he paid a second private call in a small canoe with three paddles one of which he wielded himself on this occasion there were no prostrations but if any native met his chief he simply got out of his way unless some service was required of him the ships were running very short of firewood and as there was none growing less than a mile and a half off the sea mr king was ordered to try and purchase the fence surrounding the top of the morai he hesitated as he thought that even the bare mention of it might be considered by them the priests as a piece of shocking impiety in this however i found myself mistaken not the smallest surprise was expressed at the application and the wood was readily given even without stipulating for anything in return he saw the sailors were carrying away the figures as well and spoke to koha on the subject who raised no objection except with regard to the centre one which was at once returned burney says that two launch loads for each ship were obtained a seasonable supply as we had been four months since we wooded on the thirty first of january watman one of the gunner's crew and greatly attached to cook died and was buried in the morai besant thinks that this had some influence on the minds of the natives and may have contributed to cook's death but as it was done by teriobu's special request 
it is difficult to see how the idea can be justified. A large present. Inquiries were several times made as to the date of the departure of the ships, and hints were given that supplies were running short, but at the same time they were informed that if they returned the next breadfruit season, their wants would be again supplied. When the news went forth that they would leave in two days, Tiriobu issued a proclamation for food to be brought in, so that he might make a large present on their departure, and on the appointed day, Cook and King were invited to Tiriobu's residence, where they found all that had been given in exchange to the natives was laid out on the ground, and a short distance away a large quantity of vegetables of all kinds and a herd of pigs, which were handed over on a return present being made. King says that the gift far exceeded anything of the kind we had seen. The camp ashore was then broken up, and a great effort was made to persuade Cook to permit Mr. King to remain, as he had succeeded in making himself a great favourite with all. A house that had been used by the sailmakers was accidentally set on fire, Bernie says by the natives looking for a knife lost by one of the sailors. But Besant, who places the fire at a later period, says it was done intentionally in revenge for the sailors having enticed some of the women there, and infers that Gilbert is his authority. But in the extracts he publishes from Gilbert's manuscript, there is nothing of the kind, and no one refers to any other fire till after Cook's death. End of chapter 17Chapter number 18 of The Life of Captain James Cook, The Circumnavigator, by Arthur Kitson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18 1779 to 1780 Third Voyage Concluded On the 4th of February, the ships unmoored and sailed from the bay, staring to the north in hopes of finding a better anchorage. The wind was very light, and the progress was so slow that it gave Terriobo an opportunity of sending off a further present of food. Soon after a gale sprang up, and the canoes which had accompanied them beat a hasty retreat, leaving a good many, mostly women, on board the ships. About midnight, the fore and main topsails were split, but towards morning the wind died away and they were able to bend fresh sails. A second gale came on again at night, putting them under double-reefed topsails, with topgallant yards sent down, and at daybreak the foremast was found to be so badly sprung that it was absolutely necessary it should be unstepped for immediate repairs. After considerable hesitation, for he fully recognised that the place must be almost denuded of surplus provisions, Cook decided to return to Karakakoa Bay as no other convenient place was known, and the ships again anchored there on the 11th, starting immediately to unstep and get the mast ashore when it was found to be rotten at the heel as well as sprung. Wood that had been cut at Imeo for anchor stocks was used for fishing the head, and the work proceeded rapidly, the priests making the camp taboo, so that there should be no interference with the workmen. When the ships arrived in the bay, hardly a canoe was to be seen, and none came out to the ships. This contrasted with their first reception, was the cause of some surprise, and in view of what happened afterwards, of some suspicion. But Mr. King, who had more intercourse with the natives than any of the other officers, was thoroughly satisfied that they neither meant nor apprehended any change of conduct. Burney says that Terriobu and some of the chiefs visited them on the 12th, 
and asked many questions about their return and did not seem well satisfied with the answers received trouble commences everything went smoothly till the afternoon of the thirteenth when the officer in charge of the watering party complained to king that the conduct of some of the natives was suspicious and some of the chiefs were driving away men he had engaged to help in rolling the casks to the boats king sent a marine with side arms to help to restore order but shortly after was informed the natives were armed with stones and getting very noisy so he went down himself with a marine armed with his musket and succeeded in setting matters right just at this time cook came ashore and king reported what had occurred receiving orders to fire with ball if he received any insolence or stones were thrown soon afterwards shots were heard from the discovery and a canoe was seen making for the shore closely pursued by one of the ship's boats cook king and a marine ran to intercept them but were too late as the occupants of the canoe landed before they could reach the spot burney says the disturbance commenced by a native stealing a pair of carpenter's tongs jumped overboard with them and placing them in a canoe which at once paddled off the thief was caught flogged and put in irons till the tongs were returned from the shore the same tongs were again stolen in the afternoon and the thief got away with them pursued by edgar the master in the ship's cutter and joined by the resolution's pinnace the thief reached shore first put the tongs the lid of the harness cask and a chisel in a second canoe which went out and handed them over to edgar edgar seeing cook and king running along the shore thought it right to detain the second canoe which unfortunately belonged to Perea, who at the time of the theft was in clerk's cabin and promising to obtain the tongs had immediately left for the shore he tried to regain possession of his canoe but was knocked down by a sailor and then some of the natives who before this had been quietly looking on began to throw stones and so roughly handled the sailors in the pinnace that being unarmed they beat a retreat swimming to some rocks out of reach of the missiles edgar and vancouver remained ashore and fared badly till paria who had recovered from his blow and apparently forgotten it ordered his countrymen to stay their hands and managed to save the pinnace from being broken up he wanted the boats to go back to the ships but as the oars had been taken away this was impossible he then started to find them and as soon as his back was turned the throwing began again edgar wished to go to the camp to find cook but some of the natives advised him to follow them and they would take him to perea he soon met him carrying one oar followed by a man with a broken one so they were able to make shift in the boats to the camp being overtaken on the way by perea in his canoe bringing vancouver's cap which had been lost in the scuffle owing to his pursuit of the thief cook did not hear of all this trouble till after dark too late to take any further steps but king says he appeared very disturbed by the news and remarked i am afraid these people will oblige me to use some violent measures for they must not be left to imagine that they have gained an advantage over us he then went on board his ship and ordered all natives ashore whilst king returned to the camp and doubling his sentries gave orders he was to be called for if any natives were seen about at eleven five were seen hovering near but when they found they were observed they made off and later one got close to the observatory but ran when the sentry fired over his head when on his way to the ship the next morning for the chronometer king was informed that the discovery's cutter had been stolen it had been moored to the anchor buoy on board the resolution 
he found Cook busy loading his double-barrelled gun and a landing party of marines being prepared. Cook said he was going ashore to try to gain possession of some of the principal chiefs in order to keep them prisoners till the boat was returned, and that he had already sent out boats to prevent anyone leaving the bay, with the intention of destroying their canoes if he could not recover the cutter by more peaceable means. The Resolution's great cutter was sent after a large sailing canoe that was making off, the small cutter was guarding the western point of the bay, and Cook, with the pinnace and launch, were going to Kauroa to try and get Tiriobu on board the ship. He, and in fact everyone else, were confident the natives would offer no resistance if they heard the sound of but one musket. A little before eight o'clock, Captain Cook, Lieutenant Phillips, a sergeant, corporal, and seven marines left the ship for Kauroa, and King returned to his camp after being ordered to try and assure the natives near the observatory that they would not be hurt, to keep his men together, and to be prepared to meet any outbreak. Having seen his men were on the alert, Cook visited the priests and satisfied them that Teriobu would receive neither injury nor insult. Cook lands. Having picked up the Resolution's launch under the command of Lieutenant Williamson on his way, Cook landed the Marines and marched into the village, where he received the usual marks of respect. He asked to see the king and his two young sons. The two boys came forward and conducted him to the hut where their father was, and after a short conversation, he felt assured that Teriobu knew nothing about the stealing of the boat. He invited the three to accompany him to the resolution, and the king at once consented and got up to go. However, the boy's mother came up with a few chiefs and tried to persuade him not to go, and then they got hold of him and forced him to sit down. Meanwhile, a large crowd had gathered round, and Phillips, who seemed to have acted with coolness and judgment throughout the affair, drew up his men in line on some rocks near the water, about thirty yards away. After trying for some time to persuade the natives to allow their chief to go with him, Cook gave up the attempt, observing to Phillips that it would be impossible to compel them to do so without great risk of bloodshed. Unfortunately, just at this time, news arrived that a chief of the first rank had been killed at the other side of the bay. The shots had been heard soon after the landing of Cook's party. It was now recognised that matters had become very serious. The natives were seen to be donning their war mats, and one man, armed with a stone in one hand, and a large iron spike in the other threatened Cook in a very insulting manner. He was told to keep quiet, but only became more furious. So Cook fired a charge of small shot into him, but his mat saved him from injury. Stones were thrown at the marines, and a chief attempted to stab Phillips, but was promptly knocked down with the butt of the latter's musket. Cook now fired his second barrel loaded with ball and killed one of the natives. But Sergeant Gibson told him it was the wrong man, so he received orders to kill the right one and did so. The stone throwing became heavier and the marines responded with a volley, but before they had time to reload the natives rushed them, killing four out of the seven and wounding the rest. Phillips being stabbed between the shoulders, but before the blow could be repeated, he managed to shoot his assailant. Cook's death Cook was now close to the water's edge and had turned around to order the boat's crews to cease firing and pull in. This is believed to have caused his death, for whilst he faced the natives, none of them except the one shot by Gibson had offered him actual violence. But when he turned to give orders, he was struck on the head and stabbed in the back, falling with his face in a pool of water. As soon as he fell, a great shout arose. He was dragged ashore, 
and the natives, snatching the dagger from each other, showed savage eagerness to share in his destruction. Phillips and his wounded marines plunged into the water, and covered by musketry fire gained the boats, their officer, though wounded, jumping out again to the assistance of the last man, who, severely injured by a blow on the face, was in great danger of being captured. The boats, seeing that there was no possibility of recovering the bodies of the five who were killed, were ordered to return at once to the ships from which they had only been absent an hour. Nine stand of arms, Cook's double-barrelled gun, and his hanger fell into the hands of the natives. As soon as this was reported, the boats were recalled from the bay, and a strong reinforcement was sent to Mr. King, with orders to strike his camp and get the resolution's foremast off to the ship. The Indians were seen to be assembling to the right of the tents, so the guns were turned on them, and a party was posted on the Morai to cover the place where the mast lay. About one o'clock everything was got away from the shore, only a few stones being thrown by natives, who thought their mats were proof against bullets, and only found out their mistake too late. Notwithstanding what had occurred, one of the priests, whom Bernie calls Keriake, remained with the English till everything had been removed, and supplied the men with food and water. King, about four o'clock, was sent to try to recover the bodies of the captain and marines. He was at first received with a volley of stones, which fortunately fell short. He displayed a white flag and pulled in shore, whilst the remaining boats lay off to cover him with fire if needed. But the stone-throwing was stopped, and the natives also showed the white flag. In answer to King's demand, some of the chiefs promised that the body should be delivered the next day, and Koa, swimming off to one of the boats, explained that they could not be given up at once as they had already been taken some distance up country. Burney, however, says that they gathered, from signs made by other Indians, that the bodies had already been cut up to pieces and one man came down to the water flourishing Cook's hanger, with many tokens of exultation and defiance. Koa Friendly On the 15th, Captain Clerk formally took over the command of the resolution and appointed Lieutenant Gore to the discovery. During the day, Koa visited the ship several times, and in vain tried to persuade Clerk or King to go ashore, but it was thought inadvisable to run any further risks. In the evening, Keriake and a friend came off in a small canoe, bringing a bundle containing the flesh of Cook's thighs, saying that the body had been burned and the limbs distributed amongst the chiefs. They had brought all they could get unknown to the others and Keriake strongly advised Clerk not to trust too much to Koa. He said that the inhabitants of the island were not inclined for peace, except those in the immediate neighbourhood, who would, of course, in case of hostilities, be the chief sufferers. He gave the number of natives killed as 26, with a large number of wounded. On the 17th, the ships were warped in shore so as to command the watering place. The launches were sent in for water, with the other boats fully armed in support. They were received with showers of stones from the houses and from behind stone walls, notwithstanding guns fired from the ships and musketry from the boats at any of the natives who exposed themselves. Meanwhile, Koa again visited the ships, offering a pig as a present, and asking for someone to be sent ashore for the bodies, but he was sent away, and was soon afterwards seen amongst the stone-throwers. In the afternoon, the boats went out again for water, but as the natives recommenced hostilities, they were ordered to keep clear, whilst the ship's guns were worked for a quarter of an hour 
Then the boats' crews landed and burned all the houses between the watering place and the Morai, killing some six or seven of the natives. In the evening, about five o'clock, some dozen natives bearing white flags and sugar cane marched down to the beach headed by Keriakia, carrying a small pig. He said he came as an envoy from Teriobu to make peace, and was accordingly taken on board the resolution. It was ascertained from him that the boat had been stolen by some of Paria's people and had been broken up after Cook's death. During the night, some canoes came out and did a little trading, and the next morning the bay was seen to be planted with white flags in different directions, and the waterers were allowed to work unmolested. Whilst Keriake asked permission, at once granted, to make an offering to one of the images on the Morai. Soon after, Koa came off with a pig, but was not admitted to either ship. He then went off to the waterers who sent him away, so he amused himself by throwing stones at a small party of sailors on the Morai, and drew a couple of shots from them, but escaped unhurt. Soon after, a party of natives marched down to the beach with breadfruit, etc., which they left on the beach and was afterwards taken on board. A chief, Iapo, carried a message on board from Teriobu, and the next day brought presents of food. On the 20th, the foremast of the resolution was stepped, and rigging commenced, and in the middle of the day, a large body of natives marched in procession to the watering place, beating drums, yelling, carrying white flag, sugar cane, etc., with Iopu at their head bearing a parcel wrapped in cloth containing some of Cook's bones. He went off to the resolution with Clerk, and soon after a boat was sent ashore for a present of food from Teriobu. The next day, with the same ceremonial, Iopu again appeared with all the remaining bones it was possible to recover, and was this time accompanied by Karoa, Tiriopu's youngest son. The 21st February. At sunset the resolution fired ten-minute guns, with the colours half staff up, when the remains of our late commander were committed to the deep. Lieutenant Williamson was severely blamed by his brother officers for not going to the assistance of the pinnace at the time of the attack on his captain, and it is said that had it not been for Clerk's ill health, he would have been tried for court-martial. He was afterwards, when in command of the agent corps, tried for disaffection, cowardice, disobedience to signals, and not having done his duty in rendering all assistance possible. He was found guilty on the last two counts only, and was placed at the bottom of the list of post captains, and rendered incapable of ever serving on board of any of His Majesty's ships. Cook's Remains Alice, in his tour through Hawaii, says that King's account of Cook's death from which the above has been largely drawn, agrees in a remarkable manner with that given by the natives. They in no way blame their visitors for what occurred, and even after his death, appear to have looked upon Cook as a man of a superior race to themselves. His breastbone and ribs were long preserved as relics, and in 1832, Alice states that there were many living who remembered the occasion, and all agreed that Cook's conduct to their countrymen was humane. Captain Clerk says, Upon examining the remains of my late honoured and much lamented friend, I found all his bones except those of the back, jaw and feet, the two latter articles Airpo brought me in the morning. The former, he declared, had been reduced to ashes with the trunk of the body. As Keriake had told us, the flesh was taken from all the bones except those of the hands, the skin of which they had cut through in many places, 
and salted with the intention, no doubt, of preserving them. Epo likewise brought with him the two barrels of Captain Cook's gun. The one beat flat with the intention of making a cutting instrument of it, the other a good deal bent and bruised, together with a present of thirteen hogs from Teriobu. The hands, as has been mentioned before, were identified by the scar left by the explosion of his powder flask in Newfoundland, which almost severed the thumb from the fingers. On the 22nd of February, they were able to sail from this unlucky place, and touching at one or two of the islands, worked their way northward to Kamchatka, the resolution reaching Otwatska Bay on the 29th of April, followed by the discovery on the 1st of May. They were very handsomely treated by Major Beam, the governor of Bolshersk, a place about 135 miles from the town of St. Peter and St. Paul in Awatska Bay. Notwithstanding Mr. Ismailov's letter of introduction, were on somewhat unsatisfactory lines. Mr. Weber was fortunately able to converse in German, which the Russian officers understood, and he ascertained that Ismailov had represented the two vessels as very small, and hinted that he believed them to be little better than pirates. The governor provided the ships with what he could give them, and promised to obtain further stores from Okotsk for them against their return. For these kindnesses the English could make but little return, and even then it was with difficulty that the Russians could be persuaded to receive anything, for they said they were only acting up to the wishes of their empress, who desired all her allies should be treated with courtesy. One return, however, they were able to make, which was of great service. At the time of the visit of the ships, a large number of soldiers and inhabitants were suffering very seriously from scurvy, and Clerk at once put them under the care of his medical officers, who, by the use of sauerkraut and sweet wort, made from the ship's stock of malt, soon caused a surprising alteration in the figures of most of them, and their speedy recovery was chiefly attributed to the effects of the sweet wort. They were informed by the Major that on the day of the arrival of the English party at Bolshersk, he had received a letter from the most northerly outpost on the Sea of Okotsk, stating that the tribe of Tshutsky, which had been long at feud with the Russians, had sent in an embassy offering friendship and tribute, giving as a reason that they had been visited by two large vessels in the preceding summer and had been received on board with great kindness and had entered into a league of friendship with their visitors. They therefore thought it their duty to ratify this treaty formally. These two ships could have been none other than the Resolution and Discovery, though evidently the Tshutsky thought they were Russian. Death of Clerk Leaving on the 13th of June, the Asiatic coast was followed up, and on the 1st of July they were off the Gulf of Anda, where fogs and ice began seriously to interfere with their progress. So they abandoned the Asiatic for the American side, but with no better luck. They reached the latitude of 70 degrees 33 minutes north, about five leagues short of the point reached the previous year, and at length, realising further efforts were useless and resulting in serious damage to the ships from continual contact with the loose ice, Clerk determined to return to Awatska Bay and refit and then return to England. On the 22nd of August, the day before they reached the bay, Captain Clerk, who had long been suffering from serious ill health, died and was buried under a tree a little to the north of the post of St. Peter and St. Paul, the crews of both ships and the Russian garrison taking part in the funeral ceremony, and the Russian priest reading the service at the grave. 
Clerk had been all three voyages with Cook and was only 38 years of age. Gore now took command of the Resolution, Burney, Rickman and Lanyon being his lieutenants, whilst King was the new captain of the Discovery and Williamson and Hervey his lieutenants. Bailey going with Gore in charge of the astronomical observations. On the 9th of October, they left Awatska and were off Cape Nambu, Japan, on the 26th, but were driven off the coast by bad weather and anchored in Macau Roads on the 1st of December. Here, after considerable delay, stores were obtained from Canton, and the seamen managed to dispose of most of the furs they had obtained in the north. King estimates that the two ships received, in money and goods, as much as £20,000 for the skins, and says that the men were so anxious to return for more that they were almost in a state of mutiny. On the 11th of April, the ships reached the Cape, where the officers were cordially received by Governor Plattenberg, who expressed the deepest regret to hear of the loss of Cook, and requested that he should be sent a portrait of the captain to place in a blank space he pointed out between two portraits of de Reuter and Van Tropp, a gracious compliment. Sailing from Simon's Bay on the 9th of May, the trades were picked up on the 14th, and on the 13th of June, the line was crossed in longitude 26 degrees, 16 minutes west. The coast of Ireland was sighted on the 12th of August, and an attempt was made to get into Galway Bay, but strong southerly winds drove them to the north, and at length, rounding the north of Scotland, they put into Stromness whence Captain King was dispatched overland to the Admiralty. The ships arrived off the Nore on the 14th of October, after an absence of four years, two months and twenty-two days. King meets King. On the 14th of February, 1781, the second anniversary of Cook's death, King, accompanied by Mr. Banks, was presented to His Majesty, who was pleased to accept the journals of the resolution and discovery kept during this eventful voyage. End of chapter 18Chapter number 19 of The Life of Captain James Cook, the Circumnavigator, by Arthur Kitson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19. Appreciation and Character Of course, as nothing had been heard of the expedition for a considerable time, a certain amount of anxiety was felt, which at length found vent in paragraphs in the public press, and on the 11th of January, 1780, the London Gazette contained the following. Captain Clerk of His Majesty's Sloop the Resolution, in a letter to Mr. Stevens, dated the 8th of June, 1779, in the harbour of St. Peter in St. Paul, Kamchatska, which was received yesterday, gives a melancholy account of the celebrated Captain Cook, late commander of that sloop, with four of his private marines having been killed on the 14th of February last at the island of Owyhee, one of a group of new discovered islands in the 22nd degree of north latitude, in an affray with a numerous and tumultuous body of natives. Captain Clerk adds that he received very friendly supply from the Russian government, and that as the companies of the Resolution and her consort, the Discovery, were in perfect health, and the two sloops had twelve months stores and provisions on board, he was prepared to make another attempt to explore a northern passage to Europe. Empress of Russia The London Gazette of 8th February says, 
the empress of russia expressed a most deep concern at the loss of captain cook she was the more sensibly affected from her very partial regard to his merits and when she was informed of the hospitality shown by the russian government at kamchatska to captain clerk she said no subject in her dominions could show too much friendship to the survivors of captain cook the letter written by clerk was sent by express through petersburg that is to say it was written in the extreme east of asia in june and was sent overland across siberia to petersburg and thence via berlin to london and was there published in under the six months a wonderful journey when the difficulties of transit were taken into consideration in the numerous appreciative notices that appeared in the press relating to cook and his work the morning chronicle alone strikes a jarring string which is at once met by a reply and a day or two after the same paper publishes a long letter signed columbus the style suggests the pen of sir joseph banks in which the character and methods of cook are most strenuously defended the writer claiming to have obtained his knowledge of the man through long intercourse with him the gazetta of twenty fourth january says his majesty who had always the highest opinion of captain cook shed tears when lord sandwich informed him of his death and immediately ordered a pension of three hundred pounds a year for his widow the amount really granted to mrs cook was two hundred pounds per annum and the admiralty in addition gave her half the proceeds of the journal of the third voyage a share in the journal of the second voyage and a share of the plates used in illustrating the two publications a very considerable addition to her income a coat of arms was also granted to the family by order of the king and sir w besant records his belief that it was the last one ever granted as a direct recognition of service his description of it is azure between the two polar stars or a sphere on the plain of the meridian showing the pacific ocean his track thereon marked by red lines and for a crest on the wreath of the colours is an arm bowed in the uniform of a captain of the royal navy in the hand is the union jack on a staff proper the arm is encircled by a wreath of palm and laurel a very noble shield indeed the notes of appreciation of his talent and services came from all parts of the world and none more kindly than those from the series of brilliant frenchmen who followed in his footsteps de crozet did not hesitate to throw away his own charts when he recognised the superiority of cooks and dumont d'urville calls him the most illustrious navigator of both the past and future ages whose name will forever remain at the head of the list of sailors of all nations mrs cook's letter the royal society was naturally amongst the first to recognise the great worth of its late fellow and the loss the society had suffered from his death it had already granted him one of its highest honours in the form of the copley gold medal for his successful contest with the scurvy and it now decided to mark its appreciation by striking a special gold medal in his honour this was forwarded by sir joseph banks president of the royal society to mrs cook and acknowledged by her in the following touching letter mile end sixteenth of august seventeen eighty four sir i received your exceedingly kind letter of the twelfth instant and want words to express in any adequate degree my feelings on the very singular honour which you sir 
and the honourable and learned society over which you so worthily preside, have been pleased to confer on my late husband, and through him on me and his children, who are left to lament the loss of him, and to be the receivers of those most noble marks of approbations which, if Providence had been pleased to permit him to receive, would have rendered me very happy indeed. Be assured, sir, that however unequal I may be to the task of expressing it, I feel as I ought the high honour which the Royal Society has been pleased to do me. My greatest pleasure now remains in my sons, who I hope will ever strive to copy after so good an example, and animated by the honours bestowed on their father's memory, be ambitious of attaining by their own merits, your notice and approbation. Let me entreat you to add to the many acts of friendship which I have already received at your hands, that of expressing my gratitude and thanks to that learned body in such a manner as may be acceptable to them. I am, sir, etc., etc., Elizabeth Cook. The medal actually presented to Mrs. Cook is now in the British Museum. Deaths of the Sons It is greatly to be regretted that so little can be ascertained about Cook's private life that would be of service in forming an intimate knowledge of his character. But this is accounted for by the fact that after he had joined the Navy, his time was so fully occupied by that service that he had but little opportunity to form private friendships such as fall to the lot of most men. The intimacies that he did form were mostly connected very closely with his naval duties, and his opportunities of correspondence were necessarily limited by absence from all ordinary means of communication. For a man of his marked celebrity, it is very curious that there should be such a dearth of anecdote that it is difficult to find anything that is unconnected with his profession. Of his own family relations, there is also little known, as Mrs. Cook, probably esteeming the few letters that she had from him as too sacred to be seen by any other eye than her own, as the late Canon Bennett suggests, destroyed them before her death. Still, some idea of their life together, short as it really was, notwithstanding it lasted in name for over sixteen years, may be gained from the manner in which his widow always spoke of him after his death. She always wore a ring containing a lock of his hair, and measured everything by his standard of morality and honour. The greatest disapprobation she could express was, Mr. Cook would never have done so. He was always Mr. Cook to her. She kept four days each year as solemn fasts, remaining in her own room. The days were those on which she lost her husband and three sons. Passing them, in reading her husband's Bible, prayer and meditation, and during bad weather she could not sleep for thinking of those at sea. For her husband's sake she befriended her nephews and nieces whom she never saw. Of her three sons, two entered the navy. One, Nathaniel, was lost with his ship, the Thunderer, in a hurricane off Jamaica in 1780. The eldest, James, rose to the rank of commander, and in January 1794 was appointed to H. M. Sloop Spitfire. He was at Poole when he received his orders to join his ship at Portsmouth without delay. Finding an open boat with sailors returning from leave about to start, he joined them. It was blowing rather hard, and nothing was ever heard of the passengers or crew except that the broken boat and the dead body of the unfortunate young officer, stripped of all money and valuables, with a wound in the head, was found ashore on the Isle of Wight. The third son, Hugh, 
was entered at Christ's College, Cambridge, in 1793. But contracting scarlet fever, he died on the 21st of December of that year, and was buried in the church of St. Andrew the Great, being joined by his brother James a few weeks afterwards, when the mother was left indeed alone. She survived her husband for the long period of 56 years, living at Clapham with her cousin, Admiral Isaac Smith, and at length joined her two sons at Cambridge at the advanced age of 93. Cook's character, as given by those with whom he worked, men who, day after day, were by his side, was a fine one. His greatest fault seems to have been his hasty temper, which he admitted himself, often most regretfully, but Captain King says it was disarmed by a disposition the most benevolent and humane, and it never was displayed in such a manner as to cause the loss of respect and affection of his people. He was healthy and vigorous in mind and body, clear-headed and cool in times of danger, broad-minded and temperate, and plain and unaffected in manner. His powers of observation were of the first rank. His knowledge of naval mathematics far surpassed the ordinary level and amounted to genius. But, above all, his devotion to duty was the commanding feature of his character. Nothing was allowed to interfere when he saw his course before him. Personal convenience was not allowed to weigh for one moment but at the same time he never lost sight of the interests of those under him and spared them when possible. He was somewhat silent and reserved in manner, but when questioned on any subject on which he felt he was an authority, his answers were clearly and distinctly given, and his reasons disclosed his powers of observation to the full. He was kindly, generous and hospitable, and by no means the stern character that has been painted, for even in such a matter-of-fact document as his official journal, a spirit of fun occasionally gleams out. Such was the man whose name will ever stand in the very first ranks of the British Empire builders, honest, kindly, generous, a faithful servant and a noble leader. End of chapter 19 End of the life of Captain James Cook, the Circumnavigator, by Arthur Kitson